<laughs> okay, so uh, we're now on air. I'm just here with uh, Paul Bashir from Anonymous for the Voiceless. We're just going to chat for a little bit. Paul just got off a uh, flight. I think we're both going to take one second here and share the link out, though, so that everybody can Bashir, watch uh, what's going Anonymous. on. Uh, I'm also going to put headphones on so you guys don't have to deal with this wretched echo. Um, Paul, why don't you tell people right now just, just who you are and what you do, what Anonymous for the Voiceless is, while I get my tech all set up here. I'll also give you a link so you can share it out on uh, Facebook. Cool. Um, should I put headphones on as well? Or No, the echo doesn't seem to be happening. Um, my... If you have them handy, it's good, but it's not the most important thing ever. I know mine echoes a bit sometimes, though, especially if I get loud, so... <clears throat> okay. If happens, I'll go grab them, but um, yeah, I've got AirPods. I don't tend to last all that long. That's okay. Oh, no, yeah. I, have, I, have, I have headphones, so I'll grab them if it does do that. So Yeah, pe people will be able to comment in the chat if that happens. I'm just popping out the chat. Um, okay, and I'm just going to send you a link right now. So there's the uh, actual stream if you want to share it out. I'm just going to post on Twitter. Um, which will also post it to Facebook. Um, I'll just call it streaming with Paul. Nice and simple. Cool. I'll just share this and then I'll intro myself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm just putting it out in one or two places. Um, and uh, chat, if there's any audio stuff, I can I can see you guys talking right now. You're free to tell me if we need any audio level adjustment or anything of the sort. All right. Do you have uh, a Facebook page for Ask Yourself? Pardon me? Do you have a Facebook page for Ask Yourself? Nope, I just use my personal page and I just let people uh, follow the page. No worries, I'm just looking to tag the appropriate pages here. Yeah, it's okay. People are just gathering. It's all good. Okay. All right. I've got it out everywhere. Are you all good over there too? Yep. I'm just launching it now. Sweet. Whoa. Losing a fork. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. So I think that's good. We've both been running around a lot today. So Paul just got off a flight, I think. And I uh, <laughs> I look like I'm questioning what I did with my own day. I just got off a bus a little while ago from Peterborough. So we're both a little little behind the ball. But we still wanted to make this happen today. Oh, it's, it's happening. It's too important. Oh, it's happening. It's literally happening. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Paul Bashir. I am co-founder and director for Anonymous for the Voiceless, a organization that specializes in street activism. And we were established in April of 2016. So we're under two years old. Next month, we'll have our two year birthday. And in that time, we have managed to set up Cube of Truth events in over 470 cities at this point. I can't, I don't know what the exact number is right now, but last time I checked it was 476. Uh, in every continent of the world, all the major cities, we still have need to expand into parts of Asia and Euro Asia, like Russia, China, some of these really big countries that we are yet to embark on because of the the way that the political system is structured in those countries for the most part i think that's the biggest challenge but yeah we specialize in street activism we we take it very seriously we have a a cube that we set up wearing the anonymous mask we operate as an anonymous um group and that means that the cube itself is is structured somewhat like an art performance well, very much like in our performance. And then we have the outreach team, which are doing the educating. So we don't just have, we have footage that's played on the screens. It's local footage that shows the reality of animal agriculture for the most part. 
um, but we have outreach members who talk to the public and we focus on the entire empire that is the animal exploitation industries, all of them. So not just meat, dairy, eggs, but we talk about all of it and we, we convey a very clear animal liberation message to those who do stop. But we only talk to people who stop. We don't chase people down. That's something that's unique to our style of activism. We wait for people to come to us because we believe that psychologically people need to choose to absorb this information on their own accord. Otherwise, they won't retain the information and they might be pushed further away from veganism if we're just trying to force people to get on board. So people, yeah, that's basically a summary of who I am and what AV is. And mm -hmm. people, people respond really well to the events. And we've managed to, I, get, I haven't even announced this yet because we wanted to do a public post, but we just managed to reach over 100,000 people that we've tallied taking veganism seriously. And the way that we tally those results is we go off sincere and genuine feedback from the people that we are talking to on the streets. If we can sincerely say that they're going to follow up and you know, do the research and you know, take this issue seriously. Then we'll tally that individual or those individuals, and then at the at, at the end of the event, we get a tally from all of the outreaches at each event, and then we feed that back to the stats that we have. So, yeah, we just we yeah. just reached a milestone. So that is fantastic, and you're saying it's just based on honest testimonials from people you've spoken to. That's right, because you've been at the events, yeah. That's right. You can't know 100%. Even if somebody says that they're going to go vegan, you just don't know if they're going to follow up, you know, unless you hire a private investigator to follow up on, on their lives and to really stalk them, then I, you know, it's really difficult to, to follow up and to make sure that they are going to stay. Um, but we do recommend people join challenge 22, which has a really high success rate. Yeah, everyone's promoting that these days, like Joey, James, all those guys linked to Challenge 22 in their uh, videos. That's right, yeah, and it's it's they've got a really high success rate. So I think it's somewhere over the 65% mark, 70% mark, people who do the challenge, they stay vegan after mm -hmm. it. That, yeah, that's... that's there's, there's always a little bit of skepticism I understand people having towards, you know, an organization talking about their own success rate. So, you know, obviously take everything with a grain of salt. But I think um, for me, like I have huge respect for Anonymous from, uh, for the voiceless based on what I've seen. It seems like you guys have just the one mode of activism, right? It's it's all cubes. It's all it's all street. Uh, it's all cubes, basically. Correct. Yes, but we do have a social media presence as well that we're working on. Of course, on. yeah. We're, we're, we're looking to actually build that end of what we do a lot more this year to have something we, we call AVTV. And that's yeah, going to be... Before, before you even go down that road, I'm not saying that in, in a bad way at all. I think that the Q no, no, is actually pretty much the best thing that we have. As far as street activism goes, that seems like just the best possible way to do it that I've seen come up with so far. It draws people in. There's no having to pursue them down so everyone who comes up wants to talk to you. I've seen very great uh, communicators working with AV. So to me, I've just seen nothing but positive. I don't see any foreign ideology being part of it, like intersectionality or something like this. You just keep it directly on message. So I'm all about that. But sorry, go on about uh, the, the new uh, form of activism you're going to introduce. Yeah, I, I, I didn't take it as you being um negative about that at all. I, mm. I, I just wanted to say that, that I think the perfect marriage would be between street activism and social media activism. We're trying to bridge that gap this year. So for us, we know that we are making a massive impact on the streets, but a lot of these conversations we're having are just one-on-one -on -one and we want to make sure that that impact reaches social media because it can impact thousands of people. So we want to have a project that we're working on go live this year and it's called ABTV where we have all these, well, a lot of these outreach interactions are going to be published online. And through this channel, we're just going to focus a lot on video content, outreach interactions that people can watch and, and learn from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that with, with activism, I mean, 
I don't know. There's not a whole lot of groups that I sit there and go, yeah, I a hundred percent like what you're doing. I can be critical here and there, but yeah, with AV, I just, I have so far from what I've seen, nothing but positive. And I just, I wish you the best with that. And I think it's going great. Um, you guys now have a good idea of what Paul does. So uh, his links are down below. You can go scope out AV or scope out <clears throat> his uh, YouTube and whatnot. Um, I think that the, unless there's more that you want to say there, I think we'll get to uh, kind of the meat of what we're going to talk about, no pun intended. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. I just wanted to intro myself to those of your followers who don't know me and what AV of does. Course. But yeah, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, so the post that I made that sort of started this off, I, I just posted on uh, Facebook and Twitter the other day. Um, here, I'll just find it so I can read it verbatim. Don't have to paraphrase myself poorly as I so often do. Uh, so I was talking about Gary Yurofsky. I had been thinking a little bit about uh, him and veganism. And I just said, Gary Y says intersectionalists were a major part of him quitting uh, activism. He was the most effective vegan advocate out there. Me, Vegan Gains, many others went vegan due to him. Does anybody ever consider how many more animals would have been saved if not for intersectionality? So I, I commented that, and then Paul commented below that he kind of wanted to talk about, I think just sort of sort of infighting and um, just, just trouble uh, with cohesion in the movement, basically. Well, when I saw that, it was just very timely because if you had a what I was going through at that very moment and what I was discussing with friends around me at that time, it would have been, it would have been like an aha. For me, it was just very timely. So I, mm. I just saw that amongst other things I just saw that day on social media and I just felt like the stars were aligning and I felt, when I saw your post, I thought, what better of an idea to get Mr. Logic himself and I to bounce on this idea, bounce ideas about this and to discuss this and flesh it out. So I thought, you know, cause I'm, I'm planning to talk about this more so in upcoming speeches that I'm doing at a couple of events that are a big, they're big events. And I mm -hmm. wanted to incorporate this message into my speech, but I felt that it would be a good idea to flesh this out with you before I do that. So that my message is a lot more thought out and constructed. So totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to just pick your brain on it and and see what you have to say. And I think one thing, you know, this we're not we don't have a, a super clear agenda here. We're just going to um, sort of sort of almost shoot the shit on this and troubleshoot and just just see what we think and what's up. But um, one thing to notice right off the bat is that it's likely that Paul and I will actually disagree in here. But you'll notice when it comes to this infighting, when it comes to disagreeing, there's people who understand how to disagree respectfully, and there's people who don't. Like, for example, if you watch me talk to Richard, we frequently don't converge on things. It never turns into an argument. You know, if you you watch any of these people, whether it's Paul or Emma or Joey, there's it's always a respectful conversation. When there's an error, it's like a, or a disagreement. You know, we can, if we care about it enough, put time into it and hash it out. If it's not really that important, just let it fall by the wayside. Who cares? So, so just a little bit of framing there, just you know there's there's ways to have conversations and you know if you disagree it's not actually that big a deal so yeah tell me tell me paul what your um what your thoughts are what you're kind of, what you kind of have brewing in your head when you're thinking about talking about this in the future getting some speeches together just uh, i guess about infighting and and cohesion or whatever's in your head there well one of the key things was gary you know and mm -hmm. so that's why i said it was very timely that you mentioned that i mean i i constantly think about him and what he went through and the reason oh, as to his retirement. I could say a lot about that for sure. Yeah. And so that was one thing I, I was thinking a lot about. I mean, I've got my own bag of shit that I've been dealing with since the inception of AV and, and even my time as an activist. And you know, I know firsthand for the small amount of time I've been in this game, I know firsthand that this is more of a concern to this movement than the animal exploitation empire itself. Because mm -hmm. they don't, in my view, they don't stand a chance if we're strong and we band together. 
but the infighting it the, the infighting leads to non-vegans laughing at us and the empire itself laughing all the way to the bank mm. and and we don't realize this and so with gary we i don't think we learned from that and it's happened with many other activists that i've noticed and even recently i don't know if you know who song you say is do you know who she is no i don't well sonia say is an activist who she has a social media presence and um she has a fennec fox and um this fox is in great health but for whatever reason vegans and i'm not even sure if this is entirely made up of vegans but it's made up of the majority of vegans they launched a sabotage campaign against her and the post and it, it went to the media by the way this this reached the media and so sorry, what the, uh, sorry paul i just want to be clear there's there's a woman who owns a fox and vegans went on a campaign against her is, is this woman a vegan and what's yeah, yeah. okay it's and a, what uh, are they saying is the the issue with with the fox it's a pet ownership thing or what's their what's their angle there so yeah, to, to give more context, I should have provided that. It's, no, it's um, okay. I'll just ask if I need it. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. So Sonia is a vegan, a vegan activist, and she she is she conveys a very clear animal liberation message. Mm -hmm. She has a fennec fox that she has as her companion animal, and has taken her in, um, and. Yeah, didn't get her from a breeder, didn't buy her from a breeder or any of that. A very small fox. I'm not sure if you have ever seen a fennec fox. A very small with large ears. Well, we're on the internet, so I can just look this up. Fennec fox. I think I have seen these little guys before. Yeah, yeah, okay, I totally know these little critters. Yeah. Um, and so she actually took this animal in from the wild? No, she, she took this animal in... Um, I don't know the full extent of it, but she didn't. She didn't get the animal from a breeder. And yeah, we're, the, the, we're I mean, she, she's vegan. The, I mean, she understands that that's not how we how we roll. So yeah, anyway, well, I mean, presumably, if she's taking the fox, it's from a worse situation. I mean, I'd understand if she's going out in the wild and and capturing a fox or or some shit or buying it from a breeder. Yeah, I mean, that's so that's the first thing, right? Okay. The second thing is this whole sabotage campaign was angled towards the fox being unhealthy and being malnutritioned. And so um, it's funny because it's so unfunny. Basically, the sabotage campaign itself got more likes, shares, and comments than I, that I've seen. Some, some of these posts got more likes, shares, and comments that I've seen from, let's say, a more famous vegan who posts something about animal rights, like an animal rights post targeted, targeted at non-vegans. I'm talking 10,000. Like when I looked at it over one day, it was 10,000 shares, um, six, uh, six point something thousand likes and thousands of comments. I mean, you don't even see that from, say, James Aspie, who does an animal liberation post or someone who has a large platform doing an animal liberation post targeted at non-vegans, you just don't see that same traction. I, I hear what you're saying about just the engagement level. That's a lot of likes and views. Was this actually uh, carnists who are getting in on this? I mean, it, I, it must not all have been coming from vegans. Like, were the comments all from vegans or was it Majority. the general population? Really? Majority. Wow, okay. That's that's actually shocking. But I guess I guess the underlying point being that you can rally all this support when it's against a vegan somehow. Why aren't why aren't we that united when it comes to the opposition? Exactly. Now it's weird because I don't I find it a hard thing to gauge just how how serious the infighting is, how how some of these tensions are. I mean, I don't know if it it maps out being that much easier to rally support if it's against vegans in in all contexts like I mean, there's some people who will give you shit if you talk about other vegans at all. And that, that's actually, I think, going unreasonably too far in the other end. Because 
neither Paul or I want a movement that doesn't communicate. I mean, people are not going to have all the right ideas and the way that you s stay on message and on point and, and get your underlying philosophy cleared out is obviously through discussion and disagreement. But there's a very, it's not even a fine line. It's like a, a pretty fucking clear line between reasonable intellectual disagreement and just stirring up personal hate for a person. So just on the topic of Gary Yurofsky, I mean, I find uh, some people really disagree with me here, but this is how I personally feel about the guy. I think that he was a, we, it sounds almost like he's dead now. We're talking about him in the past tense, but you know, the guy's a very kind soul, like a, a deeply emotional person. You know what I mean? And he was someone who I think it's very clear was driven by a intense emotional passion for the issue. And I think that, you know, he put in all this time over all these years. Yes, he did not have views that all of us would agree with. I mean, I don't agree with everything Gary said. We can get into it if you really want to. We can talk about what he thinks about things like violence. We can talk about, you know, other things. But I'm able to sit there and notice you know, regardless of the guy's idiosyncrasies, he's a kind soul trying to do a good thing. And most of what he's done is immensely positive. I mean, you see people like me and Vegan Gains here. If you like us, we're here because Gary made us get into veganism. We were both persuaded by his speech. You mentioned that speech, greatest speech ever in any vegan group with more than a few people. Someone will say that turned me vegan. I mean, I don't think there's anything that's had the same impact as that speech personally. So this is basically someone who's care, who cares deeply about this issue, who's not perfect, but who has put in a shit ton of time. And the community just ate him alive. I, I mean, I thought it was disgraceful, personally, the way that people were dogpiling him. I don't know what drives it psychologically. I don't know if it's that they need to one up the guy who's at the top. I don't know if it's virtue signaling. I don't know if it's I, I, I mean, I don't know what the fuck drives that. But the point is. There's a guy feeling like I've given so much, I've poured my heart into this, and I'm being rejected by the people who care the most. And I feel pretty strongly that if the message from the vegan community was something more along the lines of like, look, we fucking love Gary. We love what he's done. We don't agree with everything he says, but we want him around here. We want him doing good, and we can all just disagree like adults. I don't think that the guy would feel toxically pressured out of his own movement. I don't think that that's a crazy thing to say. So I think that there is at least this level of toxicity that can be brought out. And it's really, really destructive and really bad. And it can be a bit gray and hard to define when when you need to talk about what someone's doing and really actually call something out and when it's when it's needless. And I get that there's gray areas there. But the point is, there's this this lurking shitty force that can be activated. And I think it's what fucked over. Um, Gary's activism largely. And one more thing, you can say, oh, he's not emotionally strong enough, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, I guess if he was a different person, he wouldn't have been affected by it in the same way. You can criticize him all you want. But the point is, you're not making it any easier for the guy to keep doing what he's doing when you're giving him tons of toxic hatred instead of just constructive, positive criticism. Yeah, it's easier to say that than I mean, I would challenge anybody to do activism for 20 years and the amount of lectures he had done around America and in other parts of the world and to constantly have to deal with, I had someone say that his job was much like turning over every single piece of sand on a beach. That's what, <laughs> these, le that's what these lectures were like, you know, going to every college you'd have to go through that in order to judge and to to also withstand all of the sabotage and smear campaigns that were targeting him you'd have to withstand all of that before you could comment i think so i think he's very strong and i think what he went through is more than what most people will ever go through as an activist so very i think he's a very strong man and a very beautiful man as you said a very kind-hearted person you know, he personally helped me to become vegan and become an activist. Well, per not personally, that, that speech itself is what got me as well to become a vegan. And yeah. you know, so 
I attest my activism to this day and AV, you know, my values as an activist come from him for the most part, you know, and a lot of what I say on outreach comes from him for, the, for a large part. So I credit him really for the inspiration and the values that I have instilled within me as an activist today. And yeah, I think you're right. I mean, if he wasn't barraged by such toxic people in the movement constantly being pressured out of the out of the movement, he'd be here today, still speaking up. He'd have a YouTube channel and all of that stuff. You know, he would still be going. He'd still be going strong. I think it's likely. Yeah, and there's there's obviously like some kind of irony to oh, are you guys being toxic by talking about toxicity or, or something like this? And I I don't really think it's toxic to just point out that there's this that there I don't think it's it's toxic to just talk about the nature of the community and just just say what we actually think um I mean don't address a cancer what happens it grows and what happens if a cancer grows it, you die and that's what we're trying to avoid here we can't just ignore it and not talk about it that's why well, we're doing and we've both seen, uh, we should have actually collected some of these screenshots, but it, you see this often. It's like an activist just dips off from the movement and just says, I can't handle the way that I'm being treated by other vegans. And you're I've, like, got, uh, I've got many screenshots. I've got oh, mountains. You actually saved up the screenshots. There, there you go. Yeah, it's a real thing. And people wouldn't even know about this. You have to be kind of deep in the vegan sphere to even even be aware of this kind of shit. But it just, it just... It happens. I can say more, but do you have something you want to throw in there? Well, just with the gray area thing you mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's important that we use this time while we're discussing this to define what is and what isn't a good a good time to be, be addressing behaviors of activists in the movement that may not be sound and mm -hmm. and do away with the gray area because the gray area, as you know, can be in some people's minds can legitimize almost anything. And so that's why it's important that we define, I think, what is yeah. and what. The, the par parameters for like a valid, you know, the, what, are, what are the parameters for when it's actually legit to go and like publicly call out some other vegan? Um, yeah, so I mean, we can we can see if we can hash it down to actual like some, some core parameters or principles there, but even just getting a general idea it would do some work. Like, I mean, I think that we can acknowledge cases where it's clearly legitimate to call someone out on something. And that's when you've got someone who does not want to communicate. First of all, there's no, there's no potential to communicate with them in a debate and a discussion. And there's none of that's on the table. And what they're doing is actually like a pretty serious moral violation. I mean, if you're talking about someone who's violating you know, real core principles, um, someone who's who's going out and, uh, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's engaging in, in violence or something like this. And again, I understand that some of these things are things that we can talk about in the context of Gary. And I'm not saying that no one should be critical of some of the views he had. I, I think it's got way more to do with the kind of tone that it takes and, and our our level of awareness of, of, you know, who we're talking to and, and what they've done and the kind of respect that should be there. Um, yeah. But so I think we can agree that if it's like, if someone's um, promoting, promoting violence and promoting, you know, well, that's, that's a good starting point. We can agree promoting violence is something that is fair enough to mention, to call out, especially if the person won't communicate, they don't want to budge on it. They don't want to have a conversation about it. That's just what they're going to say. Well, Gary, you could say Gary fits into that because he was promoting violence in some of the things that he said. He said he wished that all fur wearers were raped so they knew what it was like to be elect anally electrocuted and have their skin ripped off while they're fully alive, while they're still alive. That's, I mean, that's a wish he, he declared. It was a wish and he was scorned for it to this day, still scorned over that publicly. So I think even even in those cases, I still think that we shouldn't be targeting activists because he's obviously taking an approach that's different in getting the message out there. His approach in getting people to wake up and to get the message and take it seriously was more cutthroat than others and he was going about it in a very controversial way but I still think we should have called in and spoken with him directly about it instead of calling him out over that. 
Um, I think a good example of someone who should have been who sh who should have been and did get called out was Durin Rider because mm -hmm. time and time again we reached out as a community to speak with him and he had not only did he have no interest in discussing it he was just totally and utterly delusional about the entire thing and he wouldn't listen to anybody about anything and it led to him doing not just one, two, three, or four things that were questionable. We're talking about a litany of 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 things that he did that were just unacceptable, completely unacceptable. So you mentioned that you had seen like one video of him where he was threatening Sam, a, another vegan activist, on his bike. Yeah, I haven't paid much attention to any of that, but I did see that video. I do want to come back on the Gary stuff after, though. But I, I saw a video of him basically, it, it was pretty clear he was trying to instigate a fight. Yeah, but I still, and that's that's not even the tip of the iceberg for the things that he did. So I think if it was only that that he had done, then we should have called in and communicated with him directly about it. But he's not the type of person that would respond well at all to that. So because of the litany of things he had, did, he had done, calling him out was the right thing to do. But... You know, um, well, I want to come back to Gary as well, but I could even yeah. mention Gaines. I mean, he's been scorned time and time again for the things he said on video. And then there was a guy named Vegan Atheist on YouTube who did, I think, two videos, two long-ass videos about, you know, and I just thought that was the most unproductive thing ever to do that. I mean, what do you yeah. think? Okay, well... When it comes to something like violence, like I am pretty firmly anti-violence. So, I mean, I, but the thing is, I have no doubt that I can make a video talking about whatever it might be, whether it's like Gary Orofsky or someone's views on violence without somehow t creating some vile, toxic attitude towards the person. Because the, the way that I look at something like that is you've got a imperfect human. You've got someone with a good heart who has some principles that I don't agree with, but he's still doing a ton of good. And we need to take the good and acknowledge what, you know, what we perceive to be not good. And if we want to talk about it, we can do so rationally in calm videos while, you know, paying credit to the good that he's done. So I don't, I don't see that all, um, I don't, I don't view all like constructive criticism as like a call out. Like when I think call out, I think like you're going on social media to like bitch this person out and say how they're like bad for veganism or something like this. And when I see people just saying, you know, Gary Yurofsky is bad for veganism or vegan gains is bad for veganism. Good fucking luck. Whoever is saying that in your entire life, persuading as many people to go vegan as either of them has. So it's just kind of, it's almost a bit of a know your place thing. Like realize you're just some fucking random out there and you're criticizing people who've put in a ton of good work. That is not reason to never be constructively critical, but yeah. it's it's reason to take perspective and try to try to try to be reasonable and to convey that that sense of perspective in your uh, criticism, and definitely not to create a a shark pool that wants to just eat the person alive because that's what happened with Gary specifically. But uh, yeah, what what do you have to say about some of that? We can also yeah. talk about Richard if you want to. Well, I mean, it's it's just the the point is it happens with activists all the time around the world, all the time. If you're in this movement and you're paying attention, it happens all the time. And I can definitely attest to the fact that it is the biggest problem we have as a movement. The movement itself can only be crumbled by the movement itself. The biggest threat to a movement is the movement itself. You've probably heard that expression. Well, that's that's what that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think that the animal exploitation empire has a chance if we address this cancer. And I, I, I agree about constructive criticism fully, but I don't think that what we're talking about, maybe with the vegan atheist video, that was more so constructive, but I still found it to be more of a like a moral piss pissing contest. See, see, like, well, when I'm talking about constructive criticism, now I, I'd have to watch that video. I feel like I remember it having a bit of that character too, to be totally honest. But like yeah. right now, me and you are not totally converging. We're like, I sense a bit, a bit of a divergence, and I can see you saying like, this is what I think the nature of that video is. I'm not sure if we're talking about the exact same thing, but it's not. It's not. There's no toxicity. 
there's there's just communication and we'll just we just will hash it out it's like that that's when i'm talking about constructive criticism i don't see how anyone ever could have a problem with that it's it's the the toxic shitty attitude that makes tons of vegan activists drop out of doing vegan activism that that's the shit that i'm talking about and a lot of it does have the character of a moral purity test where it's yeah. like you know whether it's uh it's you know dog piling the activist for the dog i'm just also i'm assuming for the sake of conversation that your interpretation of these things is correct because i haven't explored all of them uh but yeah you know whether it's you know castigating someone for for a dog or like you know trying to say you know vegan gains is just the worst thing for vegan activism it's like where where is your mind at do you do you not realize the actual like tangible results of some of these things do you not do you not realize the pettiness of some of these criticisms I mean, what people do commonly is they, they like to address, they like to say, I know that this person does good for animals. And then they just quickly skip over that part. So I've they'll mention it. In, in order to seem like they're being reasonable, they'll mention that and then they'll quickly skip over that, which is the most important part. And then go into why they should be damned and why they should be outcasted and why they, you know, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, I totally agree that. A lot of people like to also claim that I'm not open to constructive criticisms as an activist. I, I wouldn't say a lot of people. I'm giving too much credit to these people. It's it's really not a lot of people at all. But a loud, but, small group of people. Yeah, that's that's correct. And, <laughs> thank you. And so those people uh, really need to 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 just do some homework because if they looked at the organization that I'm at the head of. I mean, think about how many people are on board. I just mentioned before, 476 cities. Each chapter has organizers. We've got nearly 1,000 organizers on board, and we've got volunteers in the thousands around the world. And if I was not open to constructive criticism, do you think that I'd even be at this position right now? Like, do you even think that AV would have gotten this far if I was just like, nah, not open to any, you know, it's my way or the highway. <laughs> like, yeah. this. This, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think anybody, like, I think that we would just not, we would, we would have stopped our, our progression would have stopped a long time you, ago. You know, actually, I'm not, I'm not even sure about that. Cause sometimes actually things can succeed without taking any criticism. But, but point is it's, you get, it's way more traction if you can't take criticism. It's like trying to swim against a current or something. It's like, it's like having cement shoes on. It's just not, not something that you need. It's better to. Like, the funny thing is that the information to actually optimize what you're doing is coming in the form of, you know, comments from all the people connecting with your social media. It's like, you can use that information to, to just hone what you're doing to such a degree. I don't, I don't see what the benefit of ignoring it would be. Some things are worth ignoring. Sometimes you see something that's just obviously trivial bullshit. And it's like, okay, well, you know, fuck that, block that person. But you know, actual legit constructive criticism. I don't see why you wouldn't take it, and I don't think you don't. I mean, what what do they accuse you of not taking criticism on? Is there is there something in particular? One of the claims uh, that that we will just ban people who disagree with us, and our, we have a ban list, and that ban list is very very small considering the size of our organization. Mm. Uh, all, all all global animal rights organizations have a ban list, from my knowledge, and our list is very, very small. I mean, considering the amount of people that have been toxic and and have been malicious towards us, that list mm -hmm. is very, very, very small. And so these people claim that we just purely ban people over disagreements. And if you ask anybody that's on board within AV, you know, especially the core members, they can attest to the fact that we constantly have suggestions that are coming forward, constantly having constructive criticisms about different nuances that go into AV and you know we've proven historically speaking to implement many of these suggestions that come forward we, we haven't just based our, our our organization off the one model and kept it as that yeah you know? I, I banning is actually an interesting one to get into because I'm known for wielding a pretty nasty ban hammer but the thing is if you're a private individual, it's like do whatever you want. If you're if you're gonna try to be some, like like I mean, it depends to some extent on what you're doing. But it's not like 
oh, you can't criticize people. You have to, you have to agree with everything. You have to put up with whatever they want to say to you and associate with them in your personal life. It's like, no, I mean, I personally would say ban whoever you want. If you're an organization, it might be maybe not appropriate to have a massive ban list, but as a private individual, I would say do whatever you want. And I certainly exercise that privilege. I think there's a lot of just to be frank, just like scum on the internet. I mean, it's just a hole in a lot of ways. There's people who are just, are just, you know, Ruben calls them Twitter eggs. You know, it's just some anonymous person just trolling you with some stupid bullshit. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I don't, I don't feel like putting up with that. I don't need that. But um, I, I don't see how having a ban list says anything about taking criticism though, because I mean, one thing I point people to when they make that criticism of me is if you have any kind of social media presence, I'll debate you live. So that basically just completely cancels whatever criticism there is that I'm, you know, banning to avoid debate or something like this. It's like, no, just I'll, I'll have you on and have a discussion with you. So there are a few thoughts on banning. And I um, think even if they didn't have a large social media, social media presence, but they had reasonable and and well thought out arguments for you to address. I'm sure you might even consider doing it in that position as well. Am I wrong? It would really depend who it is. Like I'll stream with small vegan channels, but for debates and discussions, usually if I'm gonna spend my time having a conversation that I personally find frustrating, it's gonna be with someone where it's going to get out to an audience. Yeah, that's fair. If there was some really, you know, correct criticism that I saw coming up, I mean, I, I would probably end up addressing it anyway, but, um, no, usually if it's just a nobody, I'm not going to personally spend my time on it. I'm not saying that's the standard others have to operate by, but that's pretty much how I operate. It's like, if you want me to spend my time debating you, there has to be a benefit to it for me and the benefit for me. I like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the benefit to me is if there's an audience of your people out there who I'm going to just show all of them that you're wrong in real time. I mean, that's fine for me. Once there's enough people there, I'll totally do that. But um, just humoring every random who, and you got to remember also, Paul, everyone who sends you a message thinks they have the knockdown argument against veganism. <laughs> and after a while, I mean, it does get to a point where it's like, okay, no one actually has the knockdown argument because it's just a really basic ethical topic. So how is there even such a thing as the like, truly wise, you know, carnist of, of crazy intellectual power who's hitting you up with this super tight argument. I, I would actually contest that that doesn't even exist. If it was a more complicated topic, like we're talking about the intricacies of politics, then I'm sure you'd get hit up by more randoms with actual legit interesting points. But on something so simple, not really. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, no, I think that's good because you respect your time and it it uh, sets the tone for others to also respect your time and to respect the message itself. If they're going to engage in this kind of a topic and, and debate it, you're setting a good tone for the discussion itself, the debate itself. So that's, after hearing you say that and, and giving it a bit more thought, I think it makes sense for you to be that way and also to have your eye on the prize, which is to have these conversations, these debates, to reach as many people as possible and that can only really be achieved well, it helps a lot more when you're doing it with bigger channels. So I think that's mm -hmm. good. Yeah. And I mean, they don't actually have to be bigger than me. They don't care if they're smaller than me. They just have to not be in the pretty much irrelevant zone. If it's like they have like a few hundred subs, they, they don't really pull any views at all. It's like, that's where I'm just going to say, probably not worth my time. But, you know, anyone like you've got a like, few thousand subs, you get like regular stable views. I'll, I would be very surprised if I wouldn't spend the time talking to you. Yeah. 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 Um, so, okay. So the one thing we wanted to do, we wanted to try to get at what is, when is it reasonable to be, um, calling someone out and, and what does it look like? So let's, let's say, you know, I say some, some crazy shit. What, what would your approach be if you're like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm like associated with this guy to some extent I've like appeared with him before I, you know, I feel concerned about what he's saying or whatever. What, what is, well, I don't know. What's your idea of what to do? Uh, look, I think I'd rather answer that question as if I never met you before, never have affiliated with you before at all. Okay. So if that was the case, I would I would message you. Mm. That's how I would do it. I'd, I'd message you privately about it. 
if I was inclined to do that, if I felt compelled to to communicate with you about what had happened. Um, with Sonia Say, I reached out and I, I gave her a phone call. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, that wasn't to call her out on anything at all. That was to give her support. But the same thing would apply. If she was in the wrong, I still would have called her. Mm. You know, so... Yep. That's how that's how it should be done, I believe. But it's important just to to highlight the severity of infighting. I think before we get into how this should be done. Okay, yeah, you you do that for a bit. Take a minute, maybe you can even bring up the examples if you want to, if you have some of those posts. Well, we've talked about yeah. Okay, so we've talked about the consequence, which is that people burn out, and these aren't just these are activists who I've seen that are real deal activists who are doing good things for the movement. Yes. Really. Mm -hmm. Really, really. And, and I, I just, I have to throw something in here. A lot of the IRL people are not like tech savvy, young, social media, whatever. Like a lot, a lot of these people are not prepared for an internet hate wave. So that it's just, it's worth noticing that like sometimes what you perceive as a pretty small slight on social media, cumulatively, a lot of people doing it to someone who's doesn't have social media and hasn't dealt with barrages before that can be insane that, that can be very very intense but sorry to cut in on you there my, my bad please go ahead no that's a, that's that's true you know some some people are just most people are just not equipped to deal with that most people in the very high numbers are not equipped to deal with an onslaught of people who are supposed to be on the same team as mm -hmm. them which bothers you more than Khan's attacking you by the way at mm -hmm. least at least by a hundred times more. So, you know, pe people lose sleep. People, you know, s people don't eat over this kind of a thing, and they end up getting burned out a lot quicker from from that kind of stuff than they would anything else. So we saw it with Gary, most notably, and he said in his retirement speech, in his statement, he said that what burned him out 1,000 times more than anything else, direct quote, was infighting. And he did mention intersectionals, but I'm just going to make this more general, make it about infighting because... Yeah, let, let me throw in a word there because Paul isn't even in my camp necessarily with respect to the intersectional stuff. I've been anti-social justice way longer than I've been vegan. I, I hate it to the core. I think it's actually a, a evil, toxic ideology and I could go way into it. But with Paul, I mean, I just made this Gary quote. He commented, someone actually asked him if he's intersectional and, and his response to that was yes. Um, so I don't, I don't think that, I don't see you as particularly ideological or actually I mean, I, I think you were just kind of giving an acknowledgement to the fact that multiple issues exist and you're not against, you know, fighting other forms of injustice or some, something along these lines. But yeah, well, it, yeah. I think, yeah, I think the, the core, the core thing I'm getting at there is just that, you know, it, there's, there's, I'm just pointing out there's not even that same level of, of like kind of bias on, on Paul's end. Cause you weren't even actively opposing intersectionality or anything. No, because the ideology itself, I, I don't understand what's wrong with it. I mean, so the way I see it is that um, being concerned about human rights would be a logical extension of being concerned about animal rights in the same way that animal rights is a logical extension of human rights. And I've heard you talk about that many times. Mm -hmm. So the Bay people, you talk about animal rights as simply a logical extension for caring about the rights of humans and mm -hmm. so how could it how could it not also reach the other way but my my thing is that people, what people don't seem to understand or what intersectionals don't seem to understand is that their position that they're taking on many of these um in many of these cases is not intersectional it's speciesist they're mm. they're actually weighing up the rights of humans as more valuable than animals, and they don't realize they're doing this because of their speciesism. It's so it's so deep rooted in all of us. Yeah, I can't please, please give give us a bit of exampleage there, just so we can we can picture what you're talking about. Uh, well, the whole Holocaust thing, right? If if you use the word Holocaust, then you'll have intersectionals jumping down your throat, left, right, and center. Paul, and have you ever seen? Um, have you ever seen when they claim that black people don't need to go vegan because <laughs> they're oppressed? I haven't, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> I, well, I know. And it's like, 
you, you got to understand, like, I mean, I think Paul is what a lot of the like deep internet political sphere would call like, like a normie. It's like, you're not fucking deep in this political shit here. It's like, you're focused on some vegan stuff in a particular area. Like the, you're saying intersectionals, like that's an indicator right there. Like we'd call them like intersectionalists or whatever. But, you know, po po point, point is though, a lay person like who's not, not super deep into the politics or whatever, just looks in and hears you saying, okay, well, like, you know, there's injustice is bad no matter where it's happening. And if you oppose it in one place, you should oppose it in another place. And they just go, yeah, I mean, I can get on board with that. That sounds reasonable enough. But there's an ideology beneath the surface. And when that stuff starts coming out, then it looks even to someone who's not weighed down in that political sphere, like, this is weird. Why are you why are you saying that black people don't need to go vegan? Or why are you against the use of accurate terms that really convey the emotional reality of what's happening? You, you know, you know what I mean, Paul, because you don't you don't spend a ton of time trolling the political depths of the Internet and watching like intersectional people and criticisms of them and all this kind of stuff, do you? Oh, no, I've seen enough of it. Um, I don't I don't yeah. actively, yeah, I don't actively dive into that stuff, but I have seen enough of it to know that that many of these people are actually speciesist and are damaging the vegan movement in a very, very way because hmm. yeah they're spreading this idea that you know we can't use these terms to to convey the vegan message because it was applied to in this case the holocaust term was applied to what happened to the jews in nazi in the nazi regime well there are <laughs> there are holocaust survivors using that term themselves and there's a great there's a great video that plant-based news did with Alex, I believe his name is. I forget the surname. Uh, he's a Holocaust survivor, and he he uses that terminology himself. And him mm -hmm. being a human being means he is more sensitive towards the injustices caused to human beings, being that we are human and we stick. We're very instinctually yes. tribal, for lack of a better word. And mm -hmm. he also believes that the word is. I mean, because if you look into it. The word was actually applied to animals first. If you look mm. into it, it was actually used to describe mass killing of animals before it was used to describe what happened to the Jews in the Nazi regime. So um, the word the word itself constantly is brought up in the discussion between vegans and intersectional vegans. And mm. That's just one of the reasons why I'm saying that it's more so a species this position that's that I'm I'm seeing here. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think it's actually I think it's actually wrong for it's it's people who are saying you shouldn't use that word are actually belittling what's happening. Yes. Yes. Totally. Totally. Because the rate at which animals are being slayed outnumbers what happened in in the Nazi regime by about a billion or something, you know, like it's it, like, how could you even compare the amount of victims? So, and for mm. someone to say, don't use that word, it's like you're belittling what's happening to animals. And, you know, and, and that's totally unjust, 100%, you know, unjust. So I agree. And I mean, if if intersectionality is just agreeing that um, you should fight, you know, against whatever form of oppression it might be, well, by that logic, we're all intersectionalists. I think the reality is that there's a whole ideology there and it goes quite a lot deeper than that. It's just like when you hear someone say, I'm a feminist. It's like, OK, well, we all believe in gender equality. I mean, but the actual modern movement cares about a lot more than just gender equality. There's a bunch of myths like the wage gap, the you know, rape culture in, in Western civilization propped up by, you know, fake stats like one woman in five being raped, which if that were true, that's a higher rape rate than the Congo during the Civil War where rape was used as a weapon of war. So, so main point being, though, that there's this superficial thing we can all get on board with, like, oh, equal rights or, oh, other forms of injustice matter. But then beneath the surface, there can be quite a lot more than that. And when you notice these people who, who are saying, oh, I'm an intersectionalist, saying things like literally taking the position that black people don't need to go vegan. I mean, I think that that's, I, I just, I, I have no clue how that would not be a speciesist position. I mean, that just seems ludicrous to me. It's like, if you believe in fundamental rights, I mean, I, I would actually suggest that that's verging on being kind of paternalist, 
paternalistically uh, racist to black people being like, you know, oh, it's you, like, we can't like expect you to do what we expect white people to do. It's like, what, what the fuck are you on about? Of course you can. Everyone cannot kill an animal. Why the hell is race even a part of this? Yeah, my God. Yeah. It's insulting. I mean, you know, being vegan is a gift. You know, when you, when you, in, you convince somebody they should be vegan, you're giving them a gift. And that is that they are now able to live logically consistent with their own values, consistent with their own values, not just logically. Mm -hmm. And they're able to add years to their life and more vitality to those years and to lower their footprint and to be, to have not so much weight on their conscience. Mm -hmm. A lot of non vegans have that weight on their conscience, which is why they are so resistant to the vegan message when it comes up. But mm -hmm. you're giving somebody that gift, and to say that black people don't deserve that, or you know, don't <laughs> expect that, and that's that's insanely insulting. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we shouldn't need to play this stupid game with them of like, you know, find find the black or find the Jew. Like, oh, you can't use Holocaust. Okay, well now we have to go on a quest to find Holocaust survivors who use the word Holocaust to describe what's happening to animals. Like, yeah, we can win that game if you really want to play that game, but why the hell are we even playing that? That's identity politics. How about we just look at the dictionary and we look at if the word makes sense? Or, you know, do we have to find the black people who are going to say it's paternalistically racist to say that we don't have an obligation to go vegan also? I can point you to plenty, but that shouldn't be necessary. Why the hell would the the metric of, of what we should and shouldn't say, what's true and false, what's morally right and wrong, depend on how many people of a certain type agree with it. It's fucking retarded. And ironically is kind of racist. Yeah. yeah. So, so back to the severity and the consequence of infighting. Totally. Because I, I don't think that, I, I know a lot of people agree that it's bad. Mm -hmm. Most people will, will recognize that it's a bad thing in the movement, that it's really, really, it's really bad and we need to do something about it. But I don't think people truly understand the severity of it. Paul, and I don't even know if, if I do sometimes because, like, look, I've I've seen manifestations of it where it's gotten to insane levels and it's really toxic, like with, with Gary. So I know that the latent potential is there. And I see these testimonials, you know, not super extremely regularly, but relatively regularly. Like, you get one every, you know, month. Sometimes you'll get, like, a little blurting of them but it's just people giving up on on doing vegan activism yeah. so i don't i i kind of almost want you to persuade me of the size of this problem because i i for me it's like it's a problem it can be serious when it's kind of like conjured up like a demon by idiots but i'm not sure how how bad it is just like ambiently on the on the day today okay well okay so let's look at some stats first okay so one mm. percent of the world, no, I don't know what the percent is, but it's a very low percent. It'd be between one and 4% of the world is vegan. Mm. And 1% of the vegan movement is what you would call a vegan activist. Mm. So we ran the numbers on that. It's approximately 800,000 vegans who are active in speaking up for animals. And given that we're seven and a half billion people, that's a very small amount of people. Mm -hmm. So of those people, people who are active do not tend to have long activism careers for lack, for lack of a better word. Mm. And they tend to have short careers that last within 10 years. So other careers, music, um, business, whatever it might be, they last a lot longer than that. And so the well-being of vegan activists is at stake here because of the fact that, okay, so, okay, let me, just, let me just go back to the stats. So basically we've got a very small number of vegan activists who are fighting for the animals. And the ones who are leading this movement are vegan activists who are speaking up and, and uh, uh, they're the ones who are spearheading this revolution for the most part. You know, the, the person who owns a vegan business, they're doing their part. The person who's a truck driver speaking up, they're doing their part. But I would say they're all activists in their own way. But the ones who are who are doing this full time, who are mm -hmm. full time vegan activists, make up even more of a small number. I'm talking 
of that, I mean, I obviously don't have these numbers, but if I was to guess, I would say point less than 0.1% would be full-time vegan activists who are dedicating their lives to spearheading this message in the most effective manner out into the world. Yeah, it's small. Wow. It's very small. Very small. So of those people, these are these are the people who are doing the most for the animals. They're the, mm -hmm. And the animals have... The animals have such a small amount of people fighting for them. So the people who are doing the most for them deserve protection in the same way that the animals do. Because in, in the vegan movement, we think about the animals needing protection, but we don't think of the activists themselves who are fighting for the animals, the ones who are fighting the most for them, needing just as much protection. But that's something I, I want to change. Protection meaning due diligence, like what we're talking about with yeah, not, not freedom from disagreement. Yeah, of course, of course. You know. mm -hmm. So you're not immune to just being an asshole and um, and you know you know doing things that are obviously you know just outright wrong. So anyway, mm -hmm. going back to the stats and all of that, essentially we're talking. So all those people that are full time, very it's very 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 rare that people do this for longer than ten years. Okay, so Gary, he did it for about 20. So we can use him as an example here because he's a very prominent example to use, a very, a very big example to use. So Gary, 20 years roughly, he was an activist, burned out in his statement. He said the main reason was infighting with vegans. Vegans were the ones that were draining him, not the media, not the animal exploitation empire, other vegans. Um, and yeah, like you said, you see every month or so, you'll see someone say that they're done. They're just, they're checking out from the vegan movement and they're done. And I've seen it many, many times. So what we're talking about here is essentially, okay, in, in a day-to-day -day capacity, like you said, you're talking about like, instead of waking up and focusing all of your energy that day on getting the message out there and and doing it in an effective way, you're talking about, especially if you're, especially if you're, you're, you're a full-time activist and you're doing this, you're doing this to a large capacity. You're talking about a lot of your day being taken up with dealing with this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. myself, I've been taken to court by other vegans. I've had my time wasted with court hearings, money being paid to lawyers, and count my energy has been wasted that I'll never get back ever on dealing with with this kind of stuff. And I, you know, mm -hmm. and and that's just one part of it. But there's obviously there's like you know smear campaigns, sabotage campaigns that are launched publicly that they take they take time out of your day to address. Um, because you'll get messages from people, from example, saying, hey, I've seen this and I've heard this. Um, do you care to explain? So, you know, you will explain it, but that'll take half an hour out of your day, right? Um, yep, absolutely. And then you don't just get one message. You're getting multiple, and you're getting multiple every day sometimes, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't want to make it public because the animals are the only ones that suffer if you do that. Because, like I said at the beginning of this call, well, closer to the beginning of this call, I said, you know, non-vegans are laughing at us and non-vegans want nothing to do with this movement when they see this stuff. And then the animal exploitation empire is laughing all the way to the bank, right? Mm. And that's the other thing is that what we're, the other consequence of this is that we are not creating a great tone at all, a very bad tone for vegans or non-vegans who might want to want one day become an activist because mm -hmm. they're going to look at this community as a joke and they're going to think, well, if I'm going to become a vegan activist, I'm constantly going to be scrutinized and chastised and I'm constantly going to be attacked for any human mistake I make. You know, mm -hmm. humans make mistakes. You know, we might get angry and say some shit that isn't, isn't you know, the most politically correct. and we may do some shit that isn't politically correct. And for making these human mistakes or making these human errors, we will be 
scorned over it. And that's currently the tone of this movement. That's what I think vegans and non-vegans are looking at the movement and seeing and thinking, well, I, I don't, I'm not even going to put that in my scope. So that's mm. the other consequence is that we're, we're actually putting up a wall between us and the world and we're making it very unwelcoming for people to join this movement when they see the way that the movement behaves as a whole. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. Yeah, when it looks like it's a semi-toxic place or at least that there's not much support there if you're going to go do activism, like these things all drain from the appeal of actually wanting to get involved. And as for just vegan infighting, I mean, I'm not as tapped into the kind of grassroots as you are, you know what I mean? So I like to get different people's perspectives, but I've seen quite a lot of shit. I mean, even I was out uh, a while ago with like uh, Richard and some other people who I won't name. And they were, you know, they have, they're doing activism, running an organization and they were having crazy legal issues happening from other vegans also. Um, and then there's another that, uh, oh yeah, I mean, I talk to some of the people who run Save, uh, a Save movement for for in, in one state, and they deal with just constant shit from other vegan groups. And it's like, why, why is this a thing? Like, some of it is down to people wanting to bring their ideologies into the mix and ma make it about something it's not about. But there's also just weird sketchy human motivations there behind some of the the criticism like ego th things like this that just just don't need to be there yeah totally i mean i know someone who's running seb alex um he, he's running the barcelona save group and since he had started that group he had his own issues because it was doing really well and he's also running the av chapter over there and you know it was doing really well and he felt like he couldn't even feel proud and celebrate the small wins that he was that he was accomplishing around people he thought were his friends and his colleagues because they were starting to become spiteful and hateful and so things like that also weigh on you and drain you because you're like i can't even be someone who's did you want Sorry, to what yeah why what why would they become spiteful and hateful just just random colleagues random people around him just like they you know they feel like they're getting opportunities that that they're not except mm. you know he's getting opportunities that they're not and and so they become butthurt over it and they can't become really spiteful and okay so, that's more, so yeah, yeah. What, okay so i mean i think what we've got on the table is we definitely agree that there is a problem within fighting the scope of it is a bit hard to talk about but it's clearly a thing that happens. It clearly drives some people out of the movement. It's driven our biggest activists out of the movement. So I'm definitely not happy about it just from, from that alone. So what when, when we're talking about what we want to do, how we do want to operate, what what do we want it to look like? What's, what's the ideal kind of character of the vegan movement for you, Paul? I think this should be protocol and structure. You know, like with AV, what we did is we structured street activism to the point where it's now a professional format that accommodates for anybody in the vegan movement pretty much, any mm -hmm. walk of life pretty much. So it's a very accommodating format to get into vegan activism. I think we should also do that within the movement itself. We should provide structure to the way this is done. A protocol would be good. I was actually thinking about starting on one, just writing it down. You know, it shouldn't be too long, obviously. It wouldn't be like a three-page, <laughs> you know. Manifesto. Manifesto or something like that. It would be just one page and it would be a small, you know, protocol set of protocols that you follow when you do see something in the movement from an activist that you don't think is sound behavior. And that's why I think I'd like to do away with the gray area. How that protocol looks, I'm not entirely sure. I was hoping to flesh that out with you. You know, I'm, I'm still thinking about how that would look. Obviously, what I'm trying to move towards in my mind is more of a call-in culture than a call-out culture. Calling in makes more reasonable sense for such a small movement that has such an uphill battle mm -hmm. to to attend to. And, you know, call-out culture has worked in some instances, like with Harvey Weinstein and all of that stuff. That worked. 
you know, that really, that really. Oh, well, well, it, it just to an extent, but it also created a big snowball of, of purity seeking and innocent people just getting accused of things and the mob kind of just basically lynching them. That's true. So there's also a downside there too. Yeah, yeah that's when, when it comes to, you know, positive uh, criticism, like, I mean, I'm just trying to think what I can look to as a model. And the easiest thing for me is just how I operate with my actual friends, how we operate. You'll okay. never see. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Go on. No, no, you, you go on. You're you're the one visiting the channel, so yeah, you you go on. <laughs> I just thought about Joey. Joey's recent thing, you know, when Joey was a little bit too aggressive on on the interviews he was in. Oh yeah. I think that the way people addressed that was nonsensical too. Like they were publicly condemning his behavior when he was, yeah. Oh my lord! I didn't, I didn't tune into the response from the hurt bag fucking vegans who would rip on that. That's super annoying. For me, my my auto saying that it, it, he's too aggressive and stuff. It's like, come on, like. Well, yeah. I mean, my my automatic. First of all, that. I do not think was even an instance of being too aggressive, although too aggressive is a bit subjective. So this kind of comes down to understanding character divergence and drawing really firm lines that aren't just going to be crossed by a whole shit ton of vegans just based on their character being different from yours. But with Joey, when that happened, I mean, my automatic response was, okay, well, there's the media. They're all hating on a vegan. The proper thing right now is to boost the voice of Joey. And just yeah, just to boy. throw wind behind his sails, not to fucking stab his sails with knives while he's being gusted in the opposite direction. I mean, that just seems like a retarded thing to do. Yeah, I think that you know a good example of constructive criticism in that case was James Aspie's video about it. He did a video where he calmly explained his position on what he felt was, yeah, what he felt should have been done in that in that. Um, in that moment, but he was also saying in that video that he was, you know, saying maybe I'm wrong about my views here. Maybe, maybe Joey did the right thing, but he was weighing in on it and providing constructive criticism, which I guarantee nobody in the comment section of that video, maybe I'm wrong about this actually, would have would have taken that as as a negative or toxic video, as as no. like yeah. At all, you know. So, but what I'm referring to is the people that are being toxic and and slamming Joey over it and yeah. saying, "Fuck Joey" as an activist. Yeah. Okay. You know, we're getting at something clear here. So, there's there's a really clear difference. Well, I mean, I, I guess there is a gray zone, but it's there's sometimes a pretty fucking clear difference between just just giving someone a you know your your opinion constructively in a polite way and not agreeing with them or not agreeing entirely with them, and actually stirring up negativity towards them, trying to take them down a peg. And the latter is just a negative thing that we really don't need. I mean, it's just, it's just not doing any good. Like, when I think, how, how do we want to operate? I look to what, what kind of model do I actually have? I don't want to just fantasize or something. And I think, well, how do me and my friends operate, the people who I respect? You're never going to see a day that you know Richard or Martin or someone releases a video on their channel like you know ask yourself is fucking brutally retarded about this topic or something it's like you know because we can just communicate and if there's something actually of substance that's important that there's a disagreement on it's just a little dm and you know if it's if it matters enough you can have a public conversation about it and be like okay well we don't agree on this so let's let's talk it out it's not it's not like a there i, I just when there's mutual respect, you can tell that that level of toxicity will just never happen. There's just why would that occur? Yeah, there's something else I want to add to this. Um, yeah, I think it's important that people also consider. So one of the things I hear sometimes is, why did you delete this person or why aren't you talking to this person anymore? Right, mm -hmm. and they don't understand. They haven't seen what I've seen. So, I made a post on Facebook about this, and this mm -hmm. is maybe another aspect to what we're talking about, another angle to what we're talking about. So, I'll just read the post I made. Sure. This is something else for people to consider, I believe. 
So I said, many great activists are attacked by vegans. Unfortunately, it happens a lot in this movement. The attacks aren't cute, they aren't okay, and usually they aren't even clever. They can be easily dissected and exposed for the lies they truly are. People who are swayed by smear or sabotage campaigns that attempt to ruin the reputation of hardworking activists should consider the consequences in establishing a fixed position before doing research. Contact the activists in question directly and respectfully. Should you fail to carry out research like a responsible human being, you may find yourself consuming deceit and robbing yourself out of relationships. So that was me weighing in on that, people saying that to me, um, and also people wondering why I'm no longer friends with them on Facebook or I don't communicate with them anymore. That's, that was me weighing on and that. That's another aspect I think people should consider here is that when they do see these sabotage campaigns and they take a fixed position on it and they, they form an opinion about somebody without doing their research like a responsible person, that also will leave you in a sticky situation where you no longer have a relationship with that person and you shouldn't be surprised. Oh yeah, I mean, I get I get random people who think that I'm a racist because in here, like I'm not scared to actually name some names of people who do this kind of stuff because of Unnatural Vegan who has acted incredibly irresponsibly with her platform. I mean, look, and here's here's an example, okay? This is someone who I disagree with, who said some pretty ridiculous things about me. My attitude towards it is, you're a vegan, you're doing good work overall. I don't want to see you driven off of the internet. I would consider that a sad thing. I just think you should be responsible. And if you're going to call other vegan activists a racist or something, just defend it or retract it. And, you know, there's a time when someone is actually, if they're really doing something malicious to you, that it is appropriate to respond, especially if there's no potential for private communication at all. Um, yeah, I think that I, I lost my train a little tiny bit there. Um, yeah, so unnatural what it, what it, do that, doesn't yeah, she? <laughs> sorry, sorry what, what, what about unnatural vegan? She tends to do oh, that. She, track. She's, she's so problematic. Um, and, and also another person I'd bring up is Gary Francione. He spends most of his time, him and his, him and his band of cult-like followers, they just bash other vegans constantly. They've written off AV as a welfarist organization. They've, they've slammed us publicly many, many times. They've refused to send us outreach material to use at, their, at our events. Not that mm. we demanded much of it. Um, yeah, one, uh, after, let, let me chop in for a sec, because I don't have a particularly firm opinion. I've heard Gary say things I agree with, things I disagree with. My I, Like, here, here I go again. My general opinion is he's doing good work. I think he's turned a lot of people vegan. He has some kind of left-wing political ideology that I don't agree with, but he, you know, I'm, I'm glad to have him there doing his thing. I'm curious to hear the other side of it, but I'm also realizing right now, you know, as we share our opinions about certain people or certain things, it's like, you know, don't take our word for it either. Just go and look for yourself and and make up your own opinion. And yeah. also just, I think an, another key thing is just notice, we don't want to make someone feel like shit and, and leave veganism or, or disappear forever or something like this. It's just, you know, you disagree, you can have a conversation about it. And some people who you can't talk to and who've put out really ridiculous stuff and you have to say something about, there are times when you have to say something public, but generally it's like, you know, you can just communicate with the person. But sorry, please go on. What's what's your take on on Francione? Well, no, I've said what I need to say about him. I, I think he's problematic yeah. as fuck for the movement. But in terms of what you just said, you know, I don't think that, look, in my personal circumstance, the people who have been really malicious to me and wasted my time, money and energy, for, for the most part, these particular individuals are doing it for one reason, I believe, and that's to get the attention for me to bring it up publicly and for me to give them a platform. And mm. they want to use my hard work in order to coattail off that, in order to get their platform up. And so that's why I'm never going to give them the privilege and I'm also not going to... I'm going to do what I need to do to make sure that it doesn't go public. Their behaviour has been constantly to provoke me since the beginning of our, our falling out constantly to antagonize and provoke and it's and these individuals i'm referring to have been doing this for over a year almost weekly for over a year now 
And so this pro this provocation itself is something that's hard to deal with, very, very hard to deal with. But at the same time, I'm not going to break my circumstances may be a bit more unique than others, I don't know, but I'm not going to break and actually go public about this unless I absolutely need to, but I don't see that ever really happening. And, you know, so that's, I just wanted to weigh in on, on what you said there about that. I don't think every circumstance, you have the right to defend yourself by all means, but I think there's also ways you can go about that. You can do that in a more covert way rather than making it public because Think about like the time that I, I mean, the time that you would spend in making a video and publishing it when you could be making an animal liberation video, a video that would, you know, aim towards doing some real work for the animals. It's just, I see it as a massive waste of time to engage in that. He, comment about Francione. He's actually been the target of this also. So I don't know if you've, if you've seen this, it was a lot of intersectionalists, I think it was people like Breeze Harper, like that kind of crowd, like, you know, pre pretty hardcore intersectional vegans. And they were, I think, basically telling him that he needs to deplatform himself because he's, he's like a white man. And, you know, you even have Gary, f pretty far left guy over there saying, look, like, I believe in intersectionality and I, I believe in all this. But like, even you, you guys are too far even for me, basically, like, I'm, I'm not on board with the idea of like deplatforming me based on my race like people want to hear what i have to say i i built this platform so it, it does happen to all sorts of people and he's just another example even the person who we can talk about maybe doing some of this possibly i, I don't know enough there it's like it's happened to him also so it is, it is a real thing out there he does a lot of it yeah he does a lot of it and yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of the times, like, people will say, oh, you know, maybe you should address it publicly, you know, because the thing is, like, the people who have attacked me maliciously, I could sit down and destroy every single lie, like, quite oh, yeah. literally, emphatically. They have no mm -hmm. idea. Every little lie from every little corner that they've ever reached to, I mm -hmm. swear, I could literally destroy every every aspect of it. And... So that's not the issue. The issue is that I, I just, you know, that doesn't... Yeah, by, doing, by doing so, you platform them. I, I, I totally understand the, the dilemma there. It's like, okay, well, I could destroy this stupid criticism, but if I do it, then now more people are tuned into this fucking stupid criticism. So it's like, you know what? Look, if you guys ever actually amass enough support that you cross the threshold of being worthy of my attention, at that point, I'll consider responding. But for now, okay. just, you know fuck off into the shadows and, you know, do your worst. That's that's my position on it, on that, yeah. I feel like I could kind of sense your position on that. Okay, so let's, let's um, we've been talking for quite a while, and, I mean, we, we've just, like, spitballed a lot of shit here, but the, the general takeaways that I'm getting so far are things kind of like, you know, there's this level of toxicity that you can have between vegans, and there's such thing as just criticism, and there's such thing as uh, just needless shit stirring. And I think that the general thing that we want to be doing is most of the time, you just want to try to talk to the person in question, put put your views out there if it's, if it's really important. But if you do need to, if you, for whatever reason, are so compelled that you have to make a private or a public statement about something, I mean, yeah, if it's towards other vegans, it's best to do it in in a constructive criticism kind of sense, if if possible, unless you're just at some extreme of, you know, it's, it's just escalated to a ridiculous level and you just have to really fire back hard. I don't know. Yeah. What, what do you what do you think? Do you, you don't sound like you totally agree with that. Do you have some well, some other thoughts? Well, I just it. It's, it was still very general about the way we're touching on this, which is which is expected. So mm -hmm. for us to, I guess, be a bit more comprehensive on our position on this. So number one, it should be respectful. Number two, it should be very considerate because that should be at the forefront of our actions, considering the mass of non-vegans in this world and the empire itself that we're up against. Mm. And the very, very, very small number of vegans who are fighting for this revolution, very, very small number. So we have to be very considerate about that first and foremost, which it sounds like it, 
is a no-brainer. It sounds like people, you know, like it, this. I, I feel like I'm I'm sounding silly right now. Like it's, it's I, yeah, it sounds like it could be like trivial or a platitude, but it's actually like a pretty serious thing to get your head around. And most people just miss that point. They just don't get it. Like they just aren't that considerate, which is why I'm placing importance on that right now. Like they, mm. they just they skip over that part of being that to that level of consideration that we really need to be at. So being respectful, being considerate of that fact, calling in instead of calling out. Calling out should be the absolute last resort. And I mean, absolute last resort. And yeah, so what you were saying is that, you know, some extreme circumstance where somebody's not willing to communicate and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I still think, yeah, we need protocol on this. I still think that there should be a way to go about this because if anybody contacts me, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I don't know about other vegan activists like Gary. I don't know how Gary dealt with every message he got, but <laughs> there's some, some screenshots of how he dealt with some of those messages that are pretty funny. It, yeah. it was not, it was not always a nice response, but it was always yeah, an honest I, I response. Can imagine he would have said, sit on a knife and twist it or something like that. But look, I know myself, if someone approaches me respectfully with, constructive mm -hmm. feedback and they're wanting to work with me instead of against me and it they're proving it through their actions and not just their words mm -hmm. that's that's a key thing i have to also bring up is that actions speak louder than words people mm -hmm. love to talk like they're peaceful and they're unified in their actions people mm -hmm. love to you know confuse the narrative by saying, no, I totally support them. I'm just providing constructive criticisms. So that's also something we have to be aware of, the fake people in this movement who position themselves as being in it for unification when quite literally they're in it to destroy the reputation of other activists, quite literally. I, and I don't, I don't know if people realize when their motives can get a bit corrupted and they can actually fall down a path of doing something like that. Like, look, I'll make, very, very scathing, very harsh criticism of other vegans if it's due. If you look at my videos, I think there's a total of, of three people who are vegans who I've fired shots at. And it's been vegan cheetah, unnatural vegan, and philosophical vegan. So, I mean, I when I think about my general approach, general tone. It's like, you know, I don't know if I'm always fucking perfect. I'm always honest. I know my first resort is let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. But for me, it's like, I don't know if you're going to disagree with me here, Paul, but there is a level where someone is just being so deliberately dishonest mm -hmm. um, or, or just doing something that is so just such a, a bullshit move. Like, for example, publicly using their platform to call you a racist and then refusing to discuss or respond or defend it at all. I mean, that's the kind of thing that will actually get me to fire shots at another vegan or yeah. using your, your platform to create basically malicious, uh, slanderous, misrepresentative articles that associate me with, you know, cult leaders and charlatans and misrepresent my argumentation. Uh, it, like there's, there's a level you can go to where I'm going to just fucking annihilate you. But I, it takes a lot to actually push me to that point. My general thing is like, you know, vegans are fucking different. There's different characters. There's vegans who are friendly. There's vegans who are not so friendly. Just let them all do their thing. And unless they cross a major line, and we can be clear about what major lines are. Major lines are things like, you know, supporting violence, um, lying. I don't support lying. If someone's deliberately spreading, spreading uh, untruth or even just spreading misinformation, that's something you can call out. But in a you know, ideally privately, and then they can correct for themselves. But you could also, you know, do it in a public but respectful way, just like, you know, just a little fact checking. Here's some things, you know, whatever. Yeah, like Jane yeah. asked kind of thing. Exactly. exactly. Offering, he was weighing in on it, but doing it with such respect. I think, I think I've actually reached something here. Mm -hmm. Um, back to what I was saying about actions versus words, because lip service sure. is exactly that, but mm -hmm. action is what we should be looking at. So let's say, let's say, these people, by the way, that you're mentioning, they have publicly been slamming other vegans. So that in and of mm. itself is something we should be condemning. And if you have to resort to doing it publicly, that's totally justified, which is why I said that Gary Francione during this podcast 
and um, unnatural vegan are problematic as fuck. I've, I've said that publicly now because they publicly condemn and slam other vegans for no good reason. And, and the, the way that they use their platform is completely irresponsible. And, and just, just to butt in for one second, sorry. Um, I'd also like to clarify, you know, just for anyone who's not aware, Paul and I do not necessarily converge on everything. I don't have a particularly firm opinion with Gary. And my general opinion with Unnatural Vegan, it is actually overall positive. I just think that there's some shit that's really just not excusable without her changing or correcting it. So I, I don't know if, you, if you'd if you be on board with that. That's, that's my general feeling. She is turning lots of people vegan. She is putting out generally accurate content. She just sometimes randomly fires completely retarded shots at other vegans and then won't back them up and just leaves that there as shit sitting on them publicly. Yeah, well, that in and of itself is, again, back to the severity of that, back to the consequence mm. of that, right? Overall, her channel might be positive, but that in and of itself is contributing to the cancer in this movement that is infighting, and that cancer mm. is the only thing that will cause us to fail, in my opinion. The only mm. thing, not the empire fighting against us or the media working against us. So what I wanted to say is what I've reached, I've reached mm. a conclusion, I think, that when you're ascertaining whether you should call in versus call out or mm. you know, how to address it, whether it's public or private, mm. I think you should consider the actions of the individual in question. So let's say someone launches a sabotage campaign against me, mm -hmm. myself as an example. First look at my actions. Do I? Like these people, they do this publicly, right? They come out and they say all of this in the public eye. And they make this a public issue, which which is the absolute last resort, I believe anyone should ever take. Not even you know, it should be on the absolute last, uh, the last yeah, thing. We don't need to be airing our dirty laundry in public. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and for so many reasons, for so many reasons, why we shouldn't. But if you look mm -hmm. at my actions, I never do that. I don't. There's not a single post you'll see online from me, a single comment that that I've made, or a single you know. I just don't engage in that stuff. And if I have, it's it's you know, very, very small scale stuff here on Facebook. You might see a comment mm -hmm. from me where I've weighed in on something, but I'm still, I'm still in those moments. I'm not, I'm not doing so in an unprofessional way. I'm doing it out of pure, um, I've reached the end of my wits kind of thing. And I have to address a certain thing. I'm still mm -hmm. not, I'm still not using that as a as an as a opportunity to publicly condemn this individual and and write them off as a vegan activist and make sure no you know what I'm totally you know what of course I'm getting at? Yes. you can just look at my actions you can just look at my actions and I think if you do that with every every activist in question if you look at their actions are they a positive entity in the movement or are they known for publicly doing this? Then I would say if they are publicly doing this kind of stuff, like this kind of behavior, then it would only make sense to tit, to be tit for tat, right? If you're publicly condemning nat unnatural vegan when she's publicly doing this stuff herself, that's tit for tat. But if you're publicly um, attacking somebody who keeps the infighting private, then really like what what grounding do you have i've only just mentioned on this podcast for the first time about the fact that i've been taken to court by other vegans but i'm not mm -hmm. willing to talk about who not publicly yeah. you know? i didn't even think to ask you yeah i mean that's yeah it's it's like it's your it's your business really um yeah i, I don't know i mean does that make sense so what that I, I made? well yeah I was, I was about to i was about to hone in so the core thing you're you're saying there is that you think you should consider the character of the individual before determining how to act yeah and, and how they carry themselves i mean if they're publicly in that scope in that field of you know i don't know how to put this but you wouldn't bring a baseball bat to a tennis match. If someone's not already playing tennis, mm. why would you bring a base, you know, like why would you bring a, a tennis racket to play tennis? Mm -hmm. if, if, does that make sense? Like, I don't think. Yeah. That well, I would never think to, you know, to just totally destroy some person in, in like the, just the harshest way, some fellow vegan activist. 
for just some some little indiscretion without even like I mean I don't know I I don't I don't know I mean it just I'm trying to just get get to my overall position but I just I don't know if I've given it enough thought to to hash out a a general view it just seems to me like I think the the general principle is just taking it public is if it's if it's just in a constructive way, then you know whatever. But taking it public in a negative way just last recourse. I think I think that's just where I where I sit with this. Yeah, and I think we should publicly and emphatically condemn that behavior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm on board with that totally. And I, I mean, I've that- I've spoken about the Gary shit many times, so I think people really know my opinion on that one pretty clearly. And I think if the main influences in the movement were to publicly and emphatically condemn it, then it would trickle down. And then as a movement, we would have more of a culture that condemns this behavior, which would strengthen our, our movement a lot. Mm. So I, that's, yeah. that's what I think should happen. I think the, per, the, the, the claim being made is just as severe as the claim itself. I don't follow. What, what do you mean right there? People making these claims publicly that is just as severe as the claim itself. So what I'm saying is if it's found to, if most people don't even provide like legitimate evidence that would fly in court. Like they, they think that they have oh, evidence yeah. to have a screenshot of this and that. Like it's totally delusional. If you, it would be laughed oh, at, I in, know. you know? So that's what yeah. I'm saying. Like, you know, that's people need to understand that if you're making a claim that is just as severe as the claim itself being true or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I don't, it's, I don't know if I always agree with the statement that making the claim is as severe as the the action, but making the claim is always a fucking very serious thing that you want to be very, very careful with. I think that when I, when I look at veganism, what in my ideal world, it would just be, the culture would be something along the lines of like, we all kind of understand that we connect on this one issue. We, we agree on this basic moral principle, but we also really understand, I've talked about this a lot of times on my channel, just the diversity of humans that exist out there. We understand that people are different. Some people will be nice. Some people will be friendly. And generally speaking, we support each other and, and help each other. I think it would be better to get way more communication happening. Like this is why I do things like this. I'll talk to, you know, IRL uh, activists like you, you also do social media to be fair, but I think of you for, for whatever reason, I think of you as like a a real life guy kind of hammering away at it. And I'll talk to people like you, I'll talk to people like Richard, I'll talk to whoever, whoever it may be, because I think it's good for us to communicate. If I ever get up into like the six digit range, I'm going to make a point of actually creating a kind of vegan round table type thing where the people who are kind of more prominent on YouTube and and others from uh, from other areas of veganism can just kind of gather and talk and it'll add to just the cohesion of the movement. So, yeah, I think a good movement, it would have lots of communication. Uh, it, it would be generally supportive when there's a problem with how someone's behaving. There would be a honest consideration of just how serious is this thing? And if it is really serious, it would be, you know, you, you'd initially try to communicate with them. If you can't, then you would um, make a, you know, constructive criticism and only really get serious on someone when it really gets to the point of there's someone doing something malicious and it's clear and there's not any other way to deal with it but to respond to them. So that that's my my overall picture of, of what I think a, a good, healthy community would look like yeah well i I agree with that i'm on board with that so Mm -hmm. just to expand on what i what i meant is the claim itself being just as severe is is obviously if the claim is wrong you know so i'm not talking about Mm -hmm. if the claim was correct if the claim was 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 to fly in court like that obviously would not be wrong but i still think there should be protocol with how we address it like you said you know to bring more cohesion to the movement we should be you know providing constructive criticisms privately and only at the very last resort should we be doing things. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just, I was just nitpicking, like, because I don't think that it's as bad to accuse someone of murder as to murder someone. But I do think both are like clearly fucking bad and should should not be done unless. If you, accuse, I think that if you accuse someone of murder though, and they haven't, that's just. I mean, obviously, it's not as bad as murdering someone, but you are assassinating. It's bad though. You're assassinating. Your oh yeah. Character. I mean, look, I, I say just as bad, just to place importance of this, I get, and place importance on this. 
Yeah, I'm just nitpicking. It's it's not even a, a serious cool. thing. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> I, I just I feel that I need to expand on it so that I'm. Oh yeah, yeah. T take your time. We can just sh shoot the shit. Get out some more some more thoughts on this. Like. Okay, so I've heard really bad things about other activists. Like they're only in it for money. They're egotistical. They're you know not really in it for the animals. They're. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll just te testify right now that I get that. I, I hear that from time to time. Yeah, um, uh, and and even really bad things like they've uh, sexually abused women or sexually harassed women or um, they're sex offenders. Like these kinds of things. Like it's so it's so unbelievably not cool to say this about people if you if you do not have hardline evidence and because the proper procedure if that is the case the proper procedure would be to go to the police and to yes. go to, mm -hmm. you don't do this publicly like that should be condemned emphatically mm -hmm. yeah oh absolutely I'm a hundred percent on board there yeah you don't go try to assassinate someone's character if you have evidence they committed a crime you should go to the police. Yeah, 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 and then, then if it's you know found to be justified in the in the court of law, obviously you'd have grounding in making that claim publicly after that point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Should it should it need to come to that? You know, obviously you'd have grounding. But I think what I'm trying to say also is I think that 99% of these claims that are made are completely unfounded and baseless. And so that's why I'm drawing importance to this. And the people that are being attacked are usually doing the most by, and the people who are doing the attacking are usually doing the least. That That is something that I always notice. It's always Monday morning quarterbacking, backseat driving, whatever you want to call it. It's it's always, you know, like I'll, I'll get this shit too. This is not anything particularly toxic. It's just obnoxious, but you know, I'll get people telling me about, how, oh, you need to be nicer, do this or that when you're debating. And it's like, bro, have you been in a debate ever? Do you have do you have any cred or any reason that I should be taking your opinion seriously at all right now? Or are you just here just ripping on something that you don't even know how to do in the first place as if you're some kind of expert? So it's it's often people who don't actually do the thing in question who want to tell you about how, how much better you should be doing it. Uh, it's... <laughs> It's funny because it's so unfunny. There, are the people that are, <laughs> the people that are doing this do not realize how delusional they are. Like the people, some people have told me that if they were in my position, that AV would be thriving a lot more than it is. Or who that, would say that? Who would say that? Uh, That's yeah. a fucking weird thing to say. It's a weird ass comment to make. Yeah, delusional heroes who have a massive ego. So, I mean, <laughs> people have said this to me. People have said that my activism could, you know, I'm making veganism look bad. And these people are quite oh. literally, these, these people are quite literally doing that themselves. Like, they're, I think a lot of it is projection as well. Like, they're projecting their own laws out onto others. But anyway... The point is, the people that are doing the attacking are usually doing the least. That's a very common thread. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten shit from someone who is just, it's just some completely irrelevant nobody who's got a million problems with everything I'm doing. It's like, okay, well, you know, you go, you go do you. And part of, part of why I don't call myself an activist is because I don't, I don't want to be held to some kind of standard there. I do think that you take on a bit of a standard when you call yourself an activist. And I think that, you know, it's like, I, I just, I try my best to just steer clear of the whole getting in a massive debate about how to conduct yourself with people. You know, I'm not the most PC person. I just kind of do my thing. If you like it, you can watch. If you don't, you can uh, fuck off. Yeah, well, we're discussing styles of activism there, but you are an activist, bro. Let's be honest. You are. Um, you're you're actively participating in debating other non-vegans online, which creates discussion and it inspires other vegans to be more effective in their activism. That's activism for sure. Okay. Well, I guess what I say is 
I won't, I won't say that none of what I do functions as activism, because if my video goes out there and, you know, it persuades someone to go vegan, which to some extent they do, I do get messages frequently from people who go vegan from my stuff, although that's not my main goal when I make content. I'm making it for vegans, not for flesh eaters. But, you know, if you want to say some of my stuff functions as activism, I, I'll accept that. But something about calling myself an activist I think I've I think I've hashed this out before, but the reason I don't feel comfortable doing it is because activist it suggests that your motivation is the, a very pure motivation of I am out there to to help further the cause, and I'm happy to have that happen. But I have to say, like my main motivation is something more like self expression and just you know liking engaging with ideas and and getting rid of bad ideas it's not that i don't have moral concern it's not that i don't want to spread good ideas but i don't know that my primary motivation is a, a i i don't know it just doesn't feel it doesn't feel like pure enough like when i look at someone like joey or james you know or, or even someone like you, you actually paul it's like you know i see people who are it's like the fundamental thing driving you is a concern for it really like ethics like what i'm doing it's got a lot to do with just i like philosophy i like talking i like this and that and that's all well and good but it's just activism seems like a pretty intense kind of gold stamp to put on something like that that's how i feel personally you can call me whatever you want though that's interesting to hear how you feel about it i felt wow. that way for a long time i i just feel like when you call yourself an activist there's a real standard that that implies of how, how you, what you should be doing, how you should be acting. And I just want to be myself and do my own thing. I, I don't want to, I don't want to be held to that or looked at um, like that really. I, I think that we, we could agree also that like Joey, James, Ed, me, and the myriad of other vegan activists out there, I'm just mentioning some of the most influential. Mm. We also, want to express ourselves and combat these ideas and we also share that with you you know so i mean i can speak for myself i also am very expressive i'm a creator like i we also have a music background me and you i noticed that you do music mm. I, did, I i did music nice. for eight years. oh that's awesome you know and so this expression and wanting to correct bad ideas is also within me for sure. And, you know, I think when I heard Gary's speech, that's kind of where I was coming from. Like this logically debunks every other notion of, of uh, every notion for, for animal cruelty, for animal exploitation. It just completely debunked it. And because of that, I was on board. I was on board mm. with this. But obviously the more you look into it, it starts to overwhelm you, this, the severity of this issue when you look at how many animals are being slaughtered every year, when you have a look at the environmental destruction, and then it becomes more of a personal journey of, of justice for me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess there's some of that there, the, the expression within me as well. But, but I still think you're an activist. <laughs> well, I mean, we can uh, we can get in a huge piss, pissing fight on social media. You know, I'm going to call you out for this. Um, <laughs> make a video denouncing you. <laughs> yeah, man. So, yeah, I, I think the protocol for addressing in for addressing issues with other vegan activists. I think maybe we should try and construct for the movement. Because if there was something like a, an, an official protocol, I think people would take that seriously and champion it. Yeah, it, maybe it's worth writing some kind of fucking uh, a document or something at some point. Because when I think, I just think, what would I do with a friend? And it's like, if there is something that concerned me enough, I would say it to them privately, I'm sure. And if it was still a disagreement, I would say... If it really mattered to me that much, if it was that important, I'd say, okay, well, you know, let's do a discussion about this. And if, you know, if there's really no way to get them to talk about it and it's really important and I, I felt a deep need to talk about it, you know, I would make a video in the vein of, you know, trying, trying to keep it constructive, getting my opinion out there. And yeah, so I guess I'm thinking like, 
for, first resort is just to message and try it, try to convince and then maybe discussion. And then somewhere after that, there's like constructive um, response along the lines of like what, what James did. And then there's some extreme where it's like, okay, it's time to go to war, but that's like, like, please let's hopefully not have to go there. And the funny thing is if people are willing to discuss their ideas, honestly, it, it really just never needs to go there. So I don't know if that's getting, I think that's getting a, a bit less general. It sounds like there's like a step process kind of slowly um, condensing out, out of what we're saying here. Yes. What would you do about somebody? Let me just pose the question to you. What sure. would you do? If somebody, and I'm sure this has probably already happened, publicly claimed things about you and your character that were completely untrue and were very damaging to, it's potentially very damaging to your reputation and to your your work. Um, if it was said publicly, I would respond publicly, pretty much, pretty much certainly. And then, like, given given that this would have some kind of platform, not just someone who gets a hundred likes on the post. Yeah. I mean, if it was some random post, I'd, I'd probably just, just smack it with a quick like Twitter post or something. But yeah, no, if, if someone is putting out serious negative information about me, what would, what would I do? Yeah. How would you address it? So this well, isn't I, a friend. I, this is someone who's working against you maliciously. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I always hold perfectly to my principles, but I think my, my general thing is I would probably deconstruct it based on how, how much push they had on, on social media, how much pull. I mean, I, I would either just respond to it in the thread or if it was like someone who's actually got serious platform, I'd make a video about it. Um, and I think that I would, I'd probably pretty, um, pretty harshly disagree if they're like, what are we talking about? What are they saying? They're saying shit that's really malicious about my character. That's, that's wrong. And it's, it's obviously coming uh, from a malicious place. Yeah. Let's say, you know, they say you're a racist and that you abuse. Oh, yeah. You're, you're, you're constantly abusing. Well, I, I can just go to a real life example and we can determine what, if what I did was the best course of action. I have been called a racist publicly by unnatural vegan. Um, and I'm trying to remember the exact sequence of events, but my initial response was, I think I'm pretty fucking sure was to respond where she had said it saying, do you have any evidence? Do you want to debate it? Do you want to have a discussion? Or are you just going to say that and then dip into the shadows? It was something along those lines. And then, you know, as it persisted and I get people from her channel coming over and calling me a racist and I get, you know, just that, that kind of shit happening. It gets to a point that's like, okay, I'm going to make a video. And then when it's like, even after making videos, even after responding, she won't, uh, she won't retract or even defend the claim. It's like, at that point, I'm just going to make a running joke of it and just make, make their saying that into something that I just laugh at all the time and try to spread it almost as like a meme about them that, you know, well, this person just calls you racist and won't defend it. But again, I would really hope for a rational conversation so it doesn't need to escalate to that level. And I still, to this day, I've said this to every single person who I've had a disagreement on uh, in, or I haven't said it directly to them, but it's my principle and I hold it across the board. If you have slanderous material about me up on the internet, if you wanna come have a rational discussion about it and take down your slanderous material, I'm happy to take down my responses. I don't I don't need there to be some you know pissing content contest on the, on the YouTube or on the internet. It's like, if we can just hash it out verbally, I'm happy to delete it. Which is the best thing to do, to remove it from the universe, essentially, because, because yeah. at the end of the day, it damages the movement and the animals are the only ones who suffer in the end. And so I, I think that's- Well, sure. He, here's another, like OG Mizen, he, he fired some shots at me publicly um, in a way that I thought was really not cool. So, you know, I just, I just called it retarded on the post. I blocked him, didn't communicate with him. Um, but he, uh, he later on actually just apologized. And my response to that is just what it would always be, which is just, you know, take down the video, say it's all good and act like it never even happened.
So, I mean, I think that that that's kind of the kind of attitude that I would I would have. If someone's calling me shit in public, I would it would obviously depend on how severe it is what my initial reaction would be because if it's like conceivable that they're just under some weird impression and it's not like a super obvious shot, I'd probably offer correction DM or something like this, but if it's like they are publicly clearly firing malicious shots at me, yeah, I, I would bat it down and if it had enough momentum, I'd respond in a video. And I would really try to get them to actually defend their position in a debate or a discussion. And then oh. if, if after all else fails, they're still doing it, at that point I would just make a mockery of them. Okay. So I don't know, what do you what do you think? That that's that's me personally. No, that's good. I'm asking you because you're more so online as a YouTube activist, I would call you. I know you don't want to be called an activist, but I would call you a YouTube activist. And we'll make that, we, we can have a debate about that another time. Well, uh, yeah. you can, you, you can use the term for now. It's, it's all good, yeah. but, <laughs> uh, you know, you bring things to the public eye or, you know, that, that's what you do. So sure. that's why I'm asking you that question. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, Let's see, have we gotten out the kind of stuff that we want to get out in this conversation or is, is there more? Because I think that we've we've put across a pretty clear message. You know, infighting is a toxic thing. You don't want it. Minimize it as much as fucking possible. And I'll, even, I'll even add to that. It's the most toxic thing in this movement. Mm, yeah, I mean, you have you seem like you've seen some some shit when it comes to this. Like, I've, I've seen some shit, but, like, it seems like you've seen a whole other level of shit. We, we could just stop at Gary. We could just yeah. learn from that. We lost one of the... I, I agree. Yeah, that, that alone, actually, should be enough for everyone to go, okay, something went drastically wrong here, and we should all just observe this and take lessons from it. The lesson I take from the thing with Gary is... You should really love and respect your fellow, you know, activists or whatever, whatever you want to call people like that. He's an activist. I would definitely call him an activist. You should really respect and, and love these people, understand their personal idiosyncrasies and try to keep some fucking perspective. If they've done so much good, then acknowledge that and really respect that and and constructively say whatever your disagreement is. And, you know, I feel like if the general response to him was people you know, they could have been disagreeing to some level, but just showing appreciation, that's the main thing, not adulation, not dick riding, not anything like this, just a sense of appreciation that we actually, we know what you've done and it means the world to us. It's huge. And we have not forgotten that. We're just saying something because it's important to us also. That tone would not drive anyone to the fucking hills. So yeah, that's, that's my opinion on the Gary thing. But I think Gary alone, that should be enough to make anyone think out a few thoughts about the infighting stuff and think about what exactly are your principles when it comes to this. Yeah, and I think it should bring this to the forefront of things we're concerned about with regards to the mm. vegan movement. Gary Yurovsky's situation alone, and I wish it was only that that we could look at, but there's mountains of cases where people... Yeah are being drawn away from the vegan movement as a result of what they're having to deal with. And that's why I'm saying that this is the number one issue in the movement. It isn't the media and the empire that we're up against. It's quite literally this. Yeah, it's, it's so weird to think about because I don't know, I, like I'm just not sure if I'm totally on board with that. I agree it's a huge issue. It could be that it's the biggest issue for us. I mean, cohesion seems super important. Having a good community, it seems super important. We want, I mean, we want to grow and be constructive and function together. We don't want to, we, don't, we just, we don't want to be a fucking dark, shitty place to be. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I have seen a lot more of it firsthand. That's probably where my perspective is, is rooted so, in the importance of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, no, I'm I'm not actually saying that I I don't believe that it could be the most important issue. I just I don't know that I'm ready to even evaluate that yet. I acknowledge it's an important issue, though, at least. So it's something we should all be aware of. And um, yeah, so so when it comes to what we want to convey tonight, I mean, we've we've 
had a very shoot in the shit kind of troubleshooty, just talking type stream. But I think we've gotten our ideas out here to an extent. We're yeah. saying be aware of the infighting. We're saying if someone's fucking up, try to really weigh things in your head and consider the value they're providing before going on some social media witch hunt against them. And if something does reach the level that you have to take it a, a public you know, start constructive and only let it reach that shitty state if it really has to. So I think I think that's that's where I sit. And I'm sure someone will call me out on not being a perfect example of my own principles. And that's totally fine. I don't always I'm not always a perfect nobody's example perfect. of my own principles. It's what I nobody's, think though. Yeah, when nobody's perfect, you know. I, I I'm people could also say that about me, perhaps. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we have to start to view fellow vegan activists as you know, the ones who are doing the most for the movement that we want to try and destroy as like what we did with Gary Rofsky. Would you do that to a family member, for example? No, no absolutely would, not. Let's say your mother said some of the things that he said publicly. Would you then go on a witch hunt publicly? No, and see, that's just a useful tool for just getting in your head what it looks like to respond with love. You just swap them out with someone you do love and ask how you'd act. And if it's drastically different, then you're coming from a kind of kind of weird, emotionally devoid place when you're coming at them. Yeah. And I and I also just want to make an uh, I also want to drive this point home that that a lot of people do claim that they are going about it in a loving way, or that or they have tried. But we also have to be aware of of the level of fakeness of some people in this movement, and actions speak a lot louder than words. Oh, yeah. Just, well, yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, I've I've noticed this too. There's people who will always put on the friendly face, but they are just malicious as fuck. And the thing is, you know, I might not be the most polite ever, but everyone knows I'm honest, and everyone knows if I disagree, I'm gonna say it. And if I think you're a fucking idiot, I'm probably gonna say that too. So, you know, although I might not always be the kindest, it's like people don't have doubts about me speaking my mind when someone's always got the the friendly superficial charm attitude going on it's it's always to me it's a little bit like even if you were doing something fucked you'd be acting just like this wouldn't you so how do we really know uh, yeah that's exactly right yeah. it's uh, you know it's part of our due diligence our due diligence i think to unmask the ones who are making the claims and to also really assess their character to really assess their character and to also do so the same due diligence should be applied for them as well and um yeah you know you strike me as a straight up dude who would just you know like you said you would call someone an idiot if you thought that they were and and vice versa with those who you think high of and um yeah so i think you know yeah. in, in your case you obviously you're a good example of someone who is real and and your and your track history speaks for itself you know if i was to look at your activity mm -hmm. and the way that you carry yourself in the public eye it's very telling so mm -hmm. yeah yeah well i mean i just if you're dishonest you're just uh, you're, it's like, it's just a problem waiting to happen. It'll just create shit for you down the line. Just, yeah, it's, it's better to, I mean, my, my perspective is you should just be as straight up as possible. And the people that way, there's not some hidden figure out who this dude is. It's like, no, that that's what I'm like. So, you know, people who like you will just gravitate to you like none other people who don't like you will be polarized the fuck away from you. But that's better than having everyone feel meh about you. That's kind of been my attitude for, for a long time. But I mean, I don't care. If you want to be a people pleaser, that that's fucking fine too. It's no difference to me. And I also, I don't mean to sound like contradict myself when I say, um, yeah, if you're an idiot, I'm probably going to tell you you're being an idiot. And, you know, don't, don't just call out vegans for no reason. It's like, obviously, I don't say every thought that enters my mind. So there's a difference between being dishonest and uh, not saying every random word that enters your head. You're talking to yourself 24-7. Oftentimes, you see a uh, fucking... I just lost you there. You were, you were frozen. I don't know if you oh. lost... <laughs> no, I, 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 didn't, I didn't lose you, I don't think. But 
Um, I'm just, I was just pointing out, because sometimes people will hear things and they don't think with enough clarity about it. So it sounds like it's contradictory, like, oh, don't call out other vegans. And I would call someone an idiot if, if I felt that they're an idiot. And it can look like, oh, are those two things in, in conflict with each other? But it's like, no, that I, I, you don't speak every single, being honest doesn't mean just saying every fucking random thought that enters your head. Like often, you know, if you walk up to a fat person, the first thing in your head, you can't help your biological hard hardwiring. You notice their physical form right away. One of the first thoughts you have is this person's fat. Do you, how often do you say that when you go up and talk to them? And it's, it's not because you're being dishonest. It's just because it's just another thought in your head and you're choosing what thoughts are worth saying or not. So yeah, it's not know, appropriate it's, to what? Yes. Yeah, so it's not, it's not like everyone who I see saying something stupid. I'm like, Oh, idiot, idiot. idiot. It's like, it's more like, you know, if, if the time rises and it's got to be pointed out that someone's being stupid, you can probably trust that I'm going to call them stupid. So it, it's a, a bit of a, a difference there between saying literally everything and saying the truth when it's important to say the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you, you're someone who would be completely, you you are on board with what we're talking about, with how you would go about calling someone an idiot in the circumstance. Like you, you wouldn't just do it, like you said, with anybody and you, you certainly wouldn't do it in the public eye unless it was totally called for. Well, and it depends on the on the nature of the thing, too. Because, like, I make videos, and I make, you know, I'm fucking around. I'm saying, oh, that's fucking stupid. I'm, I'm joking around. I'm making comedy. But an actual, like, like vicious negative attack on someone, no. I mean, it would, it would take a, a quite a lot before you'd get something like that out of me. So just to bring this full circle, you know, another thing is like I was talking about the stats earlier and someone who's really important in the movement said recently that there are so many good people in this movement, but they are severely outnumbered by absolute dicks. And yeah, that's, that's the problem that we have here is that the good ones are smothered by toxic and, and malicious people. You know, so again, this is, in my view, the number one issue that we're facing as a movement, and it needs to be addressed emphatically ASAP. Yep. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know about the actual position of the issue and the stack of issues, but I agree it's a, an issue. I agree it's it's serious, and I think that yeah, I I agree we should all be sensitive to it and generally try to go for cohesion and getting along as best as we're able. And just understand, you know, there's going to be different people out there. There's going to be people like fucking vegan gains. There'll be people like Swayze. There'll be people who are polar opposites. And we should all cohere on what's important and be willing to communicate with each other and hash out differences and become a good functional super organism instead of just ripping on each other and having our insular little communities that just be, you know, it's just you fuck that. Let's just unite and, and be a good positive thing together. Yeah, so I mean, I don't, I don't know that I even have anything else to to say on this, really. I, I mean, do you feel like we've we've covered what we want to? Do you feel there's yeah. anything else you want to get in? Yeah, I think so. I think it just it, it ends up concluding now as some what I think needs to happen is is protocol needs to be laid out clearly, and then I was even thinking, you know, that protocol could be championed in some form of a day that we a, a day that we set aside every year for this issue, perhaps. Every day, every year on this day, we all actively take part in making posts on social media and or videos and weighing in on this and, and reminding everybody about the importance of, of this and sticking to that protocol. So that would be cool. Something like that would be cool to raise more awareness for this. But I'm not quite sure what the protocol. Like, I would have to sit down and, and write this out. Maybe we can discuss that offline. But you know, yeah, yeah, maybe get some some principles or something eventually. Yeah, but it's been good. It's been good to talk about this. Yeah, I yeah, think man, this absolutely is for sure. When I saw your post, and I'd I'd seen many other posts that day, it was just like, okay, this needs to happen. Well, yeah, I mean, my, my feeling is like my thoughts here aren't, you know, perfectly hashed out. I'm just kind of trying to figure out where I sit with some of this. But I mean, overall, yeah, I just I think infighting's bad. Let's let's not do it.
I've got one thing to ask you just as we close this out. Yeah, totally. Yeah, much negativity tossed your way over using the word retard? Um, to an extent. I, I get more negativity, I think, for autistic than for retard, weirdly enough. But, I mean, people just need to grow up and understand humor. Like, I mean, what what are some... I could take offense at the use of the word Jew. I don't. I understand it's being used in a funny way when, you know, when someone's, like, very careful and with their money, it's like, oh, you're being a bit Jewish. Like, it's not like some anti-Semitic slur. It's, it's called people fucking around and being funny. And I mean, do you, do you ever see a group of people of different races, like, you know, black, Asian, Mexican, whatever it might be? They All these people do will be like riff off each other's race and make like jokes and stuff like that. It's just there's some weird oversensitivity a lot of white people have, frankly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, I think that people are mad about a word like retard or, or mad about this and that. It's just the same as, you know, it's it's just who the fuck cares when people are using words. Look at the intention. Look at what do they what do they mean? Are they are they joking around? Are they being funny or are they saying, you know, I hate the mentally challenged. And, you know, when when the day comes that I say that you can rip on me for saying retard. Otherwise, it's just retarded. <laughs> the way you close that statement off. <laughs> Um, see, I, I, I think that I agree that we as a whole are becoming way too PC. I mean, the fact that we have now 50 gender pronouns and we have, um, oh, what, something else I heard recently, it was just playing on exactly how PC we're getting. It's getting, it's, <laughs> out, it's getting out of control. Sorry, I think. what are your pronouns, Paul? <laughs> I'm. <laughs> you ask me with that that <laughs> joke. I, mean, I can't take it seriously. Um, Sorry, I'm just throwing I'm, off your thought process here. Please I am continue. I'm biologically a male, so I am a male, and that's that's just what it is. I don't I don't feel that we need to identify as anything else. That's my personal views. Those views don't necessarily represent AV as an organization and how it's operated, but that's my mm. personal views. I am. I believe that gender comes down to bio, biology, and that's how I feel about it. I, I, you know, I do not discriminate against anybody when it comes to this. But that's just my view on it. But I do. I do feel we, as a whole, as a species, are becoming far too PC, and um, that's problematic. And I don't use the word retard. I sometimes slip up and use it, but I've been more conscious of it because of the fact that people I care for don't like that word being used. And I guess I haven't critically thought about it too much. I just wanted to veer away from using it because yeah. Yeah. I, I use other words like demented <laughs> mentally, mentally. Well, yeah. And the funny thing is you could take the same criticism and apply it to demented. What you, is there something wrong with demented people? I mean, why, why would you make fun of their illness? Like, so, I mean, to me, the whole thing is a big fucking joke and who cares, but I totally understand if someone who's doing, you know, who wants to just maximize how effective their activism is and just reduce unnecessary, you know, side debates as much as possible would be like, Okay, I'm just gonna not even no, let's not even open that can of words. I'm just gonna say stupid or something else till they get mad at that word too. Yeah, and I think retarded was the actual word from from what I have looked into. It was the actual medical word that was used to describe. Um, yeah, the the condition of being mentally unwell. I don't need. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and, and as for as for gender and biological sex, I mean, that's going going a bit off track. I mean, my opinion, as far as I can tell, gender is extremely highly correlated with biological sex to a point that biological sex predicts gender to like something like 99 percent accuracy. So, I mean, very, very tight correlation. There are people who have one biological sex and they say that their gender is the opposite. That is having a mental disorder. Now, I don't again, no discrimination against those people. I, I support you having all the same rights, do whatever you want to do, you do you. But um, to suggest that there isn't some kind of like abnormal functioning there and that, you know, your your gender, if you were uh, functioning completely properly would be the same as your biological sex. I mean, to suggest that that's not true seems like entering crazy land to me. But either way, 
I mean, you don't have to get on board with my and Paul's transphobic bigotry to get on board with. with <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's just a funny idea because it's like neither you or I would would ever express ill will to any of these people. We just don't yeah. agree with the, a certain aspect of what they're saying. And it's, a lot of a lot of people of that identity actually don't even agree with that crazy stuff. It comes from a particular political faction. The whole oh, you know, it's it's um there's no connection with gender and biological sex it's all just completely socially constructed like that that is its own ideology right there but that's a whole can of worms so we don't even need to we don't even need to go there yep yep all right well i think we've we've very much weighed in on this yeah, so. i i think it was good i think that i think that there's higher levels of clarity we could get to but yes. sometimes you just gotta just start a conversation and just kind of yeah. see see where you get and talk about what you talk about. And if and you want to do more later, want. yeah, yes, absolutely. Well, um, Paul, I really like talking to you. Think you're a great dude. Happy to have you on any time. Um, I'm gonna try not to go on a social media witch hunt against you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> any any final words? Keep doing what you're doing because you're helping a lot of people and you're helping a lot of vegans to sharpen your to sharpen their activism. Your logic is very much appreciated on my part. That's all I want to say. So cool. Well, thanks a bunch, man. And guys, go check out Paul. His uh, links are down below. The AV Facebook page is the biggest. It's got like 80k people or something. But his his YouTube is uh facebook the personal one that he just has followers on that's that down there too so you know go and follow all that shit he's doing good work and av is very much worth checking out actually no there is one thing we need to hit before we close this um why why is francion calling you a welfareist organization because i've talked to you enough to know that you're you don't promote welfare you you're you want veganism you don't want larger cages for slaves no, and it's something that we even have written on our website and we actively work towards an abolition message, which is, in my opinion, just a vegan message. It doesn't even need to be called abolition. It just is what veganism is. And so he called us that because we show graphic footage to the public, which he believes condones a welfareist image because then That's people... That's crazy. So there is some credence to that that I'm going to to weigh in on. I, if people just walk past and see disturbing images of animals being being abused, they may take away a message of of treating animals better, and that's that may be true. But our outreach team focuses heavily on those who do stop. We we discuss with them. Veganism. We discuss veganism in the most clear possible way, which is to to avoid all forms of animal exploitation. It doesn't just end at meat, dairy, eggs. It is the whole gambit of exploitation that we are against, and it is so easy to avoid all of it, and that's what we educate people on. So if he took the time to understand that, he wouldn't make that claim. The other thing, which was really ridiculous, he used to claim that we were well first was that we had liked... Peter's page on our face as our Facebook page. So if you have a look at our Facebook page and you scroll yeah. down, you might see that we've liked Peter's page or that we've liked. Um, and he's gone on. He's gone on record to claim that Peter is a welfareist organization because they work in cahoots with with meat, dairy, and egg companies. And I don't know the mm. full extent of all that, of that. No, I, I am actually sympathetic to that. When he says it about someone, a group like AV, I'm not sympathetic because. As far as I understand, you don't have any material that's promoting, um, you know, let's like increase the cage size or, or you know, let's, um, I don't know, like bolt, bolt gun the chickens more effectively before we kill them. I, I, I've never heard you promote that. I don't know that your site promotes anything like that. That's that's what I understand welfareism to be. Yeah, well, that's what it is. And, you yeah. know, but he, he will claim you're a welfareist if you just don't promote it the way he promotes veganism. Oh, like okay, he, well, if if by your logic, I'm a welfareist, you're a little, there's something wrong yeah, in your head. That's, there, so. that's what, he probably would call you welfareist. I wouldn't even be be surprised by that. He'd pick you something 
the offer us. Uh, and and just liking a page on Facebook does not mean anything. Like that doesn't make you a welfare organization. So, I mean, like we might share their memes, for example, like Mercy for Animals might have a good meme. Yeah. And in the past when we've been known to share it, but it's a clear vegan message in that meme. But because it's branded as Mercy for Animals, he'll say welfare organization. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I definitely don't think that just because you don't agree with an organization that you can't find value in anything they do. Like a lot of these groups go and get um, footage, for example, and the footage, I, I mean, I know he, I think he condemns that too and thinks that's a waste of resources. I, I really don't. I think that showing people what's going on is important. And I mean, if you want to say people who don't actually go and interact can take the wrong message away, maybe it's like, okay, that's kind of like saying if you watch my video on mute, you might get a welfare message. I mean, it's about what the person is actually saying. What, what are you recommending? That you just do it with no footage at all? You don't show people the reality of what's happening? It seems kind of <sighs> silly to me. Yeah, I mean, you could do that. I mean, but, you know, tell the 100 plus thousand people that we've convinced to take this issue seriously that it's not working. Yeah, I, I hear that. I mean, like, because I'm I'm very sympathetic to calling out the welfareist nonsense, but it's it's not. I don't think liking a PETA meme makes you a welfareist. I mean, and, until I see AV promoting, you know, get get rid of the rape rack and and bigger cage size and shit like this, I'm not going to say that's a welfareist organization. That seems a little crazy town to me. Okay, I was just curious about that one, Paul. So no. interesting to find out. Anyway, man, it's uh, it's great talking to you guys. Go check out Paul, and uh, yeah, you're welcome on anytime. All right, much power. Awesome. Keep well.